Okay, everybody welcome. Um, if you didn't hear earlier, um, we are live and um, we are still having people admitting a few more people into the room. Um, Larry, but I, Larry but, just joined. Just want to okay, let you know. Yes. Yeah, I got him. All right. So, and those of you who don't know, um, I'm Loretta Kaler. I'm your president of INC. We have a lot of board members on and committee chairs. So hopefully you'll hear from everybody today, but I want to do quick, um, just an introduction and we, you all should have received the, um, the um, resolution for SWIC and that's Southwest Improvement Council. So we are talking about that first, that's first on the agenda. And we wanna to go to that and talk about, um, we have, I don't, I don't know Maggie, if you can put the resolution up on the screen. I don't know if there's a possibility. And we will have a vote on that resolution today. I think part of what I hope Larry can help us with, and we have some time allocated if we, um, if you all have questions, because part of the issue is whether, you know, you have any questions pertaining to that resolution, pertaining to what's happening with um, SWIC. Um, and for those of you who don't know, we do have, INC does have an office space that we use there. So I just want everyone to know that. Um, we've had an office space there. I don't know how long, Larry. I think that would be something that, you know, you might just come back and say, but um, we have the resolution on the screen now. So I want everybody, if you hadn't seen it before, it should have been in your email as delegates. It should be on the website. Um, and I want to let everybody know, please mute if you're not speaking, if you're getting some background noise of a television or something. Hello? Uh, whoever is not muted, can you please mute? Okay, thank you. Um, and so one of the other things that I have is I'm just gonna go through this very briefly. We now have, um, we now have ground rules basically for presenters. So I wanna go through those briefly just to kind of say that and have Larry kind of speak. But I wanna let everybody know that what happened last month, we ended up, none of the chat was lost. So don't worry about that. It just came to, um, it came to myself and it was retained and questions were going back. But part of the issue is, you know, INC is trying to bring people together and we're trying to advocate for citizens. And, and you know, we're trying to engage, you know, residents with um, issues of the city of Denver. So, you know, again, you can go back and look at our goals, uh, you know, and we're trying to work with residents and neighborhoods. We also have a non-discriminatory policy. I'm gonna send this out to everyone after the meeting, but also uh, I just want everybody to know to be respectful of presenters and fellow attendees. I know it's easy on, you know, on a, on a platform when you're able to just comment to somebody and say something. I think if we were in person, it may not, it may not come out as it did. So I hope that you know, we, we maintain respect for the presenters and respect for the fellow attendees. Um, so, and then I also wanna say, just try and refrain from interrupting um, while another person is speaking, hold your questions till the end of the presenters, you know, commentation, unless they say, unless they say, you know, bring on questions anytime, but typically please wait till the end. So, and, and I will stop the chat um, because the chat goes to everyone, but I will stop it so that it just goes to, to myself and to Maggie, so that um, if there's any kind of vulgar or abusive language. So we have an openness and inclusiveness policy. So I wanna make sure everybody knows that. So please try not to belittle or insult anyone. And then all of our, all of our meetings are recorded. So I want everybody to know that, and then they're put on the website so you can view them later, all right? So that's the basics. So I wanted to go over that first. Sorry to take the time for that, but I think it's kind of vital that we kind of are all on the same page. Um, so 
and then just to let everybody know that um, we have Larry Ambrose. Larry, are you there? I am here. Okay, great. And and Maggie, if we can put that resolution back up again, and Larry, if you can, you can um, kind of go through the through what's going on with SWIC and kind of give us a background a little bit. Sure. So um, SWIC was founded in 1988 and moved into the Westwood Community Center at that time. At the time SWIC moved into the community center, it had been a community center since 1957. Various nonprofit organizations had tried to operate the community center. It was actually deeded over to the city in the early 1980s from Grace Methodist Church. So it was a gift to the city. After the city uh, received the community center, um, a number of nonprofits tried to run it and were unsuccessful in raising the money for operations. So Jan Bell, Jan Marie Bell was the founder of SWIC, was the first entity to come in and actually pay for the utilities, pay for the maintenance and operation of the uh, community center over a long period of time. In the mid 1990s, it became clear that um, the facility was not large enough to meet the needs of the community and the programs that SWIC was operating. So Jan went to the city with the idea of, uh, of creating a bond issue that could fund an expansion of the community center. The uh, Westwood Community Center was very small with a gymnasium attached to it that had been there for a long period of, of time. Oh, wow. The bond okay. issue was promoted by a committee that Jan put together. And then um, it was passed by the voters. And the money for that, uh, from that bond issue was dedicated to expanding the Westwood Community Center. That didn't take place until 2007. The bond issue was passed in 1998. During that period of time, Jan put together a committee that actually helped design the Westwood Community Center. At that time, the city was really not interested in operating community centers, especially community centers that serve senior citizens. And that's primarily what, what SWIC was doing. So the city said to Jan, look, if you operate this for a period of time, we will sell you the building uh, for $10 eventually. That promise was made by um, Wellington Webb originally and was um, uh, reinforced under the Hickenlooper administration. That was not unusual in those days. Uh, the the um, Washington Park Community Center was sold for $10 to a nonprofit organization. I believe it's still run today by that organization. So finally, in after the community center was open, that, that promise was never memorialized. But in 2010, the city finally issued a lease within the title of the agreement was a lease with option to purchase. And if SWIC was to successfully operate the community center until 2012, um, SWIC would be able to purchase the community center under this agreement. So when 2012 came around, Jan Bell sent a letter to the city uh, exercising her option to purchase the community center. There was never a response from the city. And as it turned out, the language in the agreement was basically the city would sell the community center to SWIC if the director of the real estate division so decided. The manager of the real estate division at that time and today is a woman named Lisa Lumley. So not having heard anything from the city, Jan pressed harder. There was a few memos that said, look, we need to divide the property into two zone lots before it can be purchased. And um, eventually the city finally said, we're not gonna sell it to you. We're, um, 
I, it may be also that this property and, and other city assets were pledged against bond issues or certificates of participation. So the city couldn't sell it. But from 2012 on, SWIC operated without a lease. We've been on a month to month lease for almost nine years now. When I came uh, to the community center and to SWIC in 2018, I tried to get the city to give us a long-term lease. Um, there was a period of time where we didn't hear anything. Finally, last year in November, Lisa Lumley sent us a lease which said you are out at the end of 2021. And we said, well, can we at least get an option to, to stay? And they said, no, you need to move. There was no reason given. There's still been in, there's still been no um, substantive uh, uh, reason that SWIC has to move other than the city just wants to do something else. During that period of time, uh, since last year, we did agree to sign the lease because um, we didn't go public with the information that we had to leave. And had we gone public without a lease, we could have been asked to leave with no notice whatsoever. So we have signed a lease to the end of 2021. When we signed the lease, Lisa Lumley announced that she would do a request for proposals to operate the community center after we left, and then we would be able to bid on it and come back. Um, subsequently, when the lease came to the uh, Finance and Governance Committee of City Council, um, Debbie Ortega, working with Jamie Torres, um, was able to get Lumley to agree to issue the RFP while we were there. That's a change from when we wrote this resolution. The fact is, even if we are allowed to bid on an RFP while we are at the community center, there will not be enough time for us to find another location um, if we do not, if we're not successful in getting the bid. And we've had information since then, which indicates that the city is simply not going to agree to let SWIC operate the Westwood Community Center. So we're actively looking for a building. Um, we have not been successful at this point, but on the hope that somehow we can change the city's mind, we would like enough time if there is an RFP to be able to relocate. And that's basically what this resolution does is ask for time for SWIC to relocate. All right, thank, thank you, Larry. Um, I'm gonna open this up for questions and, and if we can put the resolution back on the screen. And if there is anyone who's participating by phone and you need me to read it out loud, please let me know, okay? So otherwise it should have been emailed to you. You should have received that, but um, we're gonna put it up on the screen. And, um, and then after we've had you know, questions, if anybody has any questions, I think Larry gave a good update about where we are, where they are, um, then we can, we will have a vote, okay? So please review that if you have it in your email, if not, review it on the screen. Thank you. And you can raise your hand or you can, and it's fine if there's no questions. So just let me know. All right, I'll give everybody a couple minutes to review that. Loretta, I do have a question. Yep. Okay, Jane. Larry, are there other organizations in the building that will have to relocate? No, the Denver Public Library operates in the building um, and the Mile High Early Learning Center uses two of our classrooms and they are not being asked to relocate. Thank you. 
Is there another question? Yes, I, I wanted to just clarify. This is Heather Callahan. I wanted to just clarify. Um, I think I'm missing the. Can you clarify why you believe the um, city is doing this? Are they they they're apparently looking for competitive bids for who is to run a senior center going forward? Is that, or do they have a different purpose for the building? I, I can't tell you for sure why it's being done. It's 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 a puzzlement. <laughs> it's just a puzzlement. We there are speculation as to um, Jamie Torres, who's a city councilwoman, has said that um, you know it's just time for Swick's been there thirty three years. It's just almost like we've been there too long. Um, and um, that it's important to, to hear from the community as to what they want. She has engaged, um, she's embarked upon a, what she's calling a community engagement process where she's put out a survey. The survey is, is pretty biased. In the finance and governance committee meeting, um, she asked questions which intimated that we were not welcoming to non-English uh, speaking people. I can tell you that is, there couldn't be anything further from the truth. I'm not sure where that came from. Uh, we have Spanish speaking staff. We have a number of clients. We have about 350 <clears throat> clients over the age of 60. I would say 15 to 20% of them are non-English speaking and um, we are welcoming to everybody. We don't turn anybody away. And we're, uh, um, we have a, in our, you know, since the pandemic, we switched over and, and um, INC has been very supportive of our food pantry program. Our, our um, food pantry is about 28, 28% <laughs> Hispanic, about 38% Asian American. Um, we have um, just a very, very diverse uh, population of people that we serve. And I said, everybody, um, not everybody is over 60. We also serve the community with our food pantry. I think there's, there's just intimations of us not being responsive to the community, but there's been no, over all this period of time, we've never received any kind of negative feedback nothing in writing from the city that we're doing anything wrong, nothing verbally. Um, it's just a mystery as to why this is being done. We have heard that Parks and Recreation wants to operate the gym. Um, there are very few nonprofits who have the wherewithal to fund the hundred to $150,000 maintenance and operations budget for the community center. And so I'm suspecting that this RFP will find very few uh, organizations that qualify and that uh, maybe a city agency like Parks and Rec will step in and operate the building. Um, keep in mind also that the RFP process is one that is decided by Lisa Lumley and real estate and then judged whoever is to get the the contract is to be judged by city agencies. The city council person is not involved in that process, nor is the community. So we're not convinced that even if we bid on an RFP, the, the ultimate decider in this case uh, will be fair as to who receives the bid. Hey, Larry, we have one other question that was in the chat and I wanna bring that to you. And also, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody um, else can speak to, you know, the same thing happened with uh, Denver Open Media, their space on 7th and Kalamath. Um, anyway, similar, uh, I wish Ian was here right now. I don't think he's back, but I know he knows more about that. The question is from Judy Baxter, what is meant or expected by the, the be given support from the city 
in relocating that portion of the resolution that says be given support from the city in relocating. So um, one of the things we, SWIC has some assets and we would be selling some of our assets in order to, to uh, make a down payment on a new facility. Um, should that happen, the difference between what we can pay and the purchase of a building, for example, is very hard to come by for nonprofits. We, we only operate a year or two of funding and then we, I mean, that's true for almost all nonprofits unless they have an endowment. So it's very hard to get a loan. We would hope that the city would be open to either guaranteeing a loan or from the Office of Economic Development, perhaps giving us a loan um, in order to, a mortgage loan, in order to be able to purchase another building. That's the kind of thing we're asking for, we would be asking for from the city. Thank you, that really helps helps me understand what, what you want. And I think it's a, a great request. Okay, Carol Hunter had a comment question. Um, the entities calling for vacating the property sound extremely disingenuous. Any thoughts as to who to question about the decision? I'm not quite clear about, could you rephrase that so that I'm clear about that? I mean, why any, are they doing? Yeah, any thoughts, and, and maybe Carol, you want to, but any thoughts as to question about their decision? Carol, do you want to chime in? Yes, I will. Um, I'm just curious as to who to contact, whether we're talking about the, the developer that you mentioned or a council member or some of the players um, who are operating in this decision. And so who do, I, it, this just sounds like there are excuses being put forth and they're not really discussing or revealing what the real reasons are for this decision. And I just like to go to folks and ask, but I want to make sure I'm using my time wisely and talking to the right people as to questioning this decision. Does that help you? Sure. Um, so, so first, as I, we mentioned before, there's some, in, some con misconception that SWIC has not been ecumenical or open to, um, to non-English speaking people. That's one of the things we've heard simply not true. And I think if you came by and talked to our clients, um, well, of course we're not open right now, but um, <clears throat> just stand there when we do our food pantry and see the people who are in the cars that come by, um, that would be dispelled. Um, Lumley, Lisa Lumley recently was audited by, the, by Tim O'Brien it was not a pretty audit. It was, it was not complimentary to her management skills. Um, back in 2012 to 2014, there was some interaction between Lisa Lumley and, and Swick, Jan Bell, wherein she was very upset about Swick charging the, the library rent. We charge the library um, a fee. Uh, it's, it's not really rent, it's, it's a overhead and maintenance fee, which is based on what it costs us to operate the Westwood Community Center. We have to pay utilities, water, maintenance, anything under 7,500 in maintenance was our responsibility. Um, and it costs anywhere from 100 to $150,000 a year. That includes insurance, all kinds of costs. So based on a square footage calculation, we were charging the library money to be in the building, their fair share. She considered that it was a city, it was a city agency and we had no right to charge that. The same is true with Mile High Early Learning Center. They used the gymnasium, two classrooms, all the common areas. We dedicate two bathrooms. And she, there was something came up in the the finance and governance committee where we were criticized for charging 
Mile High Early Learning Center. That seems to be something that Lisa Lumley just doesn't like. She wrote it out of our, our lease. She let them stay. She included them for the until the end of the year. But that's been kind of a something that's in her craw. It's completely unfounded and we can't operate without charging um, for, for the space. So excuse and, me for interrupting, Larry, but who yeah. other than Lisa Lumley, and I don't even know if it would be worth my time to contact her because she sounds pretty resolute in right. the decision and isn't going to sway much, but everybody's got a boss. Everybody reports to somebody else. And um, so I just, I'm just i just interested in if maybe it, you don't have to do it within this time frame, but letting us know as soon as possible who some of the other people are that will be, that have some sway here. Um, so who, who supervises, for lack of a better word, Lisa Lumley? And again, are there city officials that could be contacted about this um, to work on your behalf? Um, so that's just, that's what I'm act, asking. And if somebody comes, you know, if you, <laughs> if somebody comes off the top of your head that you think of, fine, but if not, maybe that could be just something that you let us know as soon as possible about. So I can tell you that right now. Okay. So Lisa Lumley reports to Jeffrey Steinberg. Okay. Okay. He reports to the manager of finance. And I can't remember that gentleman's name. Somebody here probably knows who that is. I think he might even be deputy mayor now, unless it's Don Morris. And then they report to Michael D. Hancock, gotcha. the mayor. Okay. Thank you. Also, in so right now, Jamie Torres, who is a city councilwoman for District 3, as I said, is conducting some a process where she's involving other nonprofits <clears throat> and has indicated, at least privately, that she'd like to see SWIC stay uh, if other nonprofits come in. But we have it on good authority that we would have to rent from somebody else, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing if that were to happen. But we just can't be assured that that's going to happen before we have, before our time runs out to relocate. So um, I think at this point, uh, Torres is, is operating in good faith. But in the end, it's the under this administration, under the charter, it is the real estate division who actually makes this decision and the other city agencies, not the city council person. All right, we have one last question and that question um, goes to um, uh, Jeannie Granville. Um, Larry, would you share the SWIC staff demographics and how many live in the Southwest area? Yeah, that's one of the questions that came up. So um, in terms of our staff, we have 10 employees, uh, four are full-time, um, six are part-time employees. Um, I think 60% are over the age of 50. We have um, uh, one African-American, three Hispanic Americans, one Asian American, um, and the rest of us are, I guess, classified as Anglo. So about 50 or 60% minority in terms of the staff. Our board of directors is um, um, also very diverse. Oh, you ask about who lives in the Southwest Denver area that's on the staff, uh, one, two, I think four or five live in Southwest Denver of the 10. Um, in terms of our board of directors, we have three Hispanic, two Asian American. Um, we have two Buddhists, two Catholics, one Jew, and the rest are Protestant. <laughs> so we're diverse religiously and ethnically. We do have, um, I think, a pretty diverse group of people. We have an African-American staff person as well. All right, great. Um, Maggie, can we put the vote up? All right, so 
Um, here's the vote if you don't see it. And if you're on phone, please let me know. Um, but go ahead and click on yes or no on the vote. Okay. Hey, I've got a question. Uh, maybe it's for Maggie. Maggie, can you tell on the back end who voted and whether there was a D associated with them or not? So a reminder, if you're a delegate, make sure that you're a voting delegate, okay? I don't know if we can. Um, right, so I'm just trying to figure out if there's gonna be any way for us to determine um, if you're a delegate or not from the vote. I mean, other than we could trust people, obviously. I think at this point in real time, we'll have to trust people. Now, I believe there is a report process that can be pulled okay. after the meeting closes. Okay, I think we should pull it just so you know. Okay. So that we have the correct information, at least at some point. Yeah. Thank you. And Betsy says, yes, you should be able to download the, the report of the poll. And Lucia also does, says also. Yep. Thanks. All right. We'll give it, a, you know, a few more seconds or so. And I think most people have had that opportunity to vote. Um, let me know. Um, Marlene Johnson, did you have a question or is your hand raised for a vote? No question. I just wanted to make sure you realized I was voting for it. So I, I've submitted my vote and I raised my hand. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I just want to make sure we got it all. All right. And, and I, I hope that everybody has voted now. And it looks like the vote has has carried. Let me tell you what it is. It looks like there is 34 votes yes. That's 81 percent. Uh, three votes no, seven percent, and five votes abstaining. Okay. So thank you so much, Larry, and thank you so much for voting, everyone, and your questions. Um, we're going to move. Thank you. On. We're going to move on now to um, our committee reports. And I have a couple of announcements and I want to make sure that everybody knows again, we're looking for members of the um, of the board. So please let us know if you are interested. You can do that via email. Um, you can do that um, on the website. So or let us know at the end of the meeting or in the chat today. Thank you so, for that. And we'll get another update on that. So and and um, the other thing is we need at large um, and other positions. I think it's posted on the website. Um, the other thing is we need volunteers for the um, annual audit committee. So if anybody has participated in that previously or um, is interested in that, you can email us or email president at denverinc.org or um, go to the website or contact Greg, our treasurer. Um, the other issue is we have, uh, we have uh, awards in March, so I'm going to go there, and if we can take the poll down, am I able to drop that? Okay, good. Um, Jane, do you want to talk about awards? We'll start there. Yes, thank you, and I love seeing that rose garden behind you today when it's so cold out, so <laughs> I just would like to invite everybody to the... Uh, annual awards ceremony this year. Of, of course, it will be virtual because everything we're doing right now is virtual, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been outstanding members of our community that need to be recognized. So on March 13th at our regular delegate meeting, right after the election of officers at 10 o'clock, we will have our annual awards ceremony. So Maggie has been helping me to work out the details because we're gonna be showing photos of everybody and bringing up a lot of different people. So thank her again for making that happen. Uh, we will have four youth awards this year. Um, and the youth award committee is Hank uh, and Stella and Karen. And I want to thank them for doing that. We will have seven neighborhood star awards and five honorary awards. And the committee that's been working on that is Mary Jane and Rudy. 
and Sally and Ann White. And I want to thank all of them. They've been great committee members. They've really taken on getting all the information in and helping to make these photos possible. So I hope you're looking forward to joining us that morning. Um, our MC will be James Mejia, and we're going to have a couple of uh, surprise presenters that day. So after the election, go pour yourself another cup of coffee and join us for the award ceremony for those who have achieved and deserve some merit for what they've done in 2020. All right, thanks so much, Jane. Um, Maggie, do you wanna update us on parks and let us know when the next meeting is also? Sure, just let me pull my, no my notes up. Uh, our next meeting is going to be February 16th at six o'clock. Uh, and we're going to have two speakers at this meeting. Uh, we'll have uh, Jacqueline Altritter, who's the project lead for Denver uh, Museum of Natural History. A and what they're working with is a project that restores portions of the historic DeBoer waterway uh, within City Park. Uh, this has been down for a while. It's a beautiful, beautiful concept, and they've had so much community feedback. So she'll be presenting that to us. And our second speaker will be Brad Cameron. And he's a member of the INC Park uh, designation team. And Brad's going to give a report on the new park designations that have occurred. We've had six or seven of them. Uh, and um, we're slowing a little bit, but we're still designating parks. Uh, for those of you who don't realize how important it is to have a park designation, once the park has been designated, the park cannot be sold without a vote of the people. I'm done. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. So uh, Tuesday at six o'clock. Um, Transportation Committee, Joel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you know, a transportation committee meets every other month. Our next meeting will be Thursday, March 11th uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. via Zoom, and that agenda is coming together. We do have the uh, video of the previous meeting, which had uh, a lot of great uh, folks. We had the head of uh, Department of Transportation and Infrastructure. We had the head of RTD and others. Uh, that is on the INC YouTube channel. All right, thanks, Joel. Um, next up is Climate and Sustainability Committee. I don't know if Perry or- I'm here, Jane, do you want me to do it? I'll yes, go for it. Um, yes, please. Okay, um, Jane and I are co-chairing the committee for those of you who haven't met. I live in Platte Park. I'm not a formal delegate right now. Um, our Climate Sustainability Committee has a few main focuses right now. The top one is recruiting uh, more diversity into our committee from um, the west side and the north, northwest side, other parts of the city. If any of you know people who are interested in these issues, um, we are working on April 10th. We have a... a community-wide discussion, very similar to the uh, reimagining policing in Denver that um, happened earlier or later last year that was so amazing. We're working very closely with the new Office of Climate Actions and uh, Sustainability and Resiliency. Liz Babcock and Taylor Muller, some of you may know, are terrific. They're helping us secure speakers from various agencies who do work related to climate. Um, because it's not just about the new office in the mayor's office, it's also about community planning and development, transportation and parks and rec. Um, it's gonna be amazing. Jane came up with the name of Climate Action. It starts and ends with neighborhoods. We are um, working to get a speaker, a specialist from, or a special climate environmental health professor from CU. And um, it's gonna be great. The city is not only helping us with speakers, but they're helping us by providing translation services, as well as all of the uh, promotional power they have through their newsletters and mailing lists. So um, we think that's gonna be big on April 10th. Um, so equity, that meeting, and then we are going to follow Joel's lead and do um, 
quarterly or every other month uh, sessions. We know that the first one will be focused on climate justice. Equity will be a big theme on April 10th, but we don't have enough time to do a deep dive there. And we know that's something we wanna lead with. So that'll be our first evening session. Um, I, I think that's it. Uh, oh, we have a meeting next Thursday at two. We're keeping our committee small until we can diversify and at the same time welcoming anybody who wants to participate. But we're not actively recruiting at this time, but we, but we welcome you. So um, put your name in the chat if you wanna hear about um, when we're meeting this coming Thursday. Okay, so, and that'll be via Zoom and you'll, and you can, if, do you need an email address for people then? Is that what you'll need? So you can oh, send out a link? Yeah, yes. If, okay. if people are interested, put your email in the chat. Okay, you have one already. Great. Loretta, okay. Loretta I would like to add that the reason that we're <clears throat> working very hard to have some good diversity on the committee is that 50% of the funds that will be derived from this tax will go to neighborhoods that are hardest hit by climate change. So we want to make sure we have really good representation from those neighborhoods. So that that's why we've made that our number one priority. And I want to follow Larry's great example of having such a diverse board and such a diverse community that he supports. Okay, great. You have a couple of names in the chat. Thank you both. Thank All you. right, next up, um, Christine. I don't think Ian's here. Christine, uh, zoning and planning, thank you. Yep, I'm here. Um, thank you, Loretta. Uh, we have a very exciting meeting coming up, February 27th, two Saturdays from now, either nine or 9.30. But I just wanna remind everybody on this call, if you want to be sure to get our emails, please get on the zoning or zap list. Just send an email to zoningplanning at denverinc.org and get on it. But we're gonna have uh, Councilwoman Stacy Gilmore talk about her proposal for a rental registry. And as those of you who were involved in our discussions about group living last summer, one of the um, things that we pushed for in our July resolution was that the household definition be changed at this in concurrently with setting up a rental registry. So this is moving forward. And I think we're gonna learn a lot. The council has a lot of questions, but, um, and I did send out an email with the link if you wanna watch it ahead of time. So I hope people can come. We have a lot of work to do this year. The next things we're gonna do is dive into chapter 59. Maybe at the end of the year, uh, the questions aren't residential infill, but we need more people who are willing to dig into details. We need people to work on short-term rentals. We need people to work on rental registry issues. We need some more people on the team. So I'm hoping that people will come. Um, so, and then Loretta, this is not really from Zap, but I am wondering if you could spend a little bit more time talking about the board openings. I don't think you did that justice. And I think we're gonna wind up with the same INC board. We're just gonna sort of rotate positions. And I don't know if people know that we really do want some new blood from the community, from delegates who have not served yet. So I'm hoping you'll come back to that, Loretta. I, I know you said it and it's in the email, but I don't think we're stressing it enough. The names, you have to get your name in soon. Right, so. for, the, for those of you who don't know, again, our election is next month. We really need some candidates for the board. I mean, we want INC to succeed and we want to make sure we have representation from across the city. That's a big part of it too. Um, you know, I mean, right now we have Drew, who's in Elyria Swansea, so it's nice to have somebody there represented, but he may be going into the Peace Corps. So we do want to make sure that, um, and I don't know, Drew, if you're here today, but we would, you know, he may, he's a delegate at large, so we do um, want to make sure, if you didn't see Hank earlier, um, he's assessing his abilities based on, um, you know, something that had transpired. So we want to make sure that um, we have we have somebody to replace him. Uh, mm. So we may have two delegates at large. Uh, we really need some representation from the west side. Um, you know, if we want to practice what we preach, we would love to have more diversity too. So I, I'm going to stress that. Um, 
So, you know, that's a big push for us. And um, for those of you who don't know, um, INC is spending some funds that we've had, we allocated, we voted on that and allocated that last year because of the issues that have transpired that we want to have diversity training. For those of you who didn't see um, Justin Cooper, I think all of you kind of now know who he is. Um, he's, he's helped us a bit. He understands INC. So um, we will be signing a contract with him to work with us. Um, he's gonna help us work on diversity for INC. I think one of the things that happens for us, and we've been talking about this since George was president two years, three years ago, we've been talking about diversifying. We've been talking about it for as long as I've been on the board. So we've been talking about diversifying, getting younger people. We all know we need to have a diverse age group. We, we need to encourage people who are you know renters in the city since 51% of the city is renters. So we want to encourage a broad base of the city of Denver and get people involved. So that's really important. I think the board is moving in a good direction to get some really good issues. And I think if you see topics that we have coming up like the climate and sustainability, the we're gonna have our next panel on the next stage and kind of the rethinking the police, the whole process of you know, um, ticketing, charging, courts, that type of thing. And then we'll have a third session later in the year, but that's coming up in May. So we need some people who are engaged and want to be here. Now, your commitment would be, you know, delegate meetings um, again, um, but also, you know, board meetings. So we meet um, the second Monday of the month. And of course we're doing it via Zoom. So you're, you're not driving anywhere. So that's fortunate until we all can meet again. Um, but it, it's, it's, a commitment if you can be you know if you have issues and want to bring those into INC that's great I love to hear from people who want to have topics because you know it can't just fall on me or one board member so we want people to you know come in being engaged so it's it's amazing to have people who are interested who want to push us forward on our goals and want us to work being engaged with the city and engage with our neighbors so so we encourage people to come on right now. Troopty, if you want to speak, um, she's she's our VP for now. I'm trying to encourage her to stay, but <laughs> she's being pulled by a lot of directions. So she um, may be leaving. And so <laughs> I'm going to leave that up to you, Troopty, to talk about. And um, so, and we also need a secretary. And um, and minutes will be coming out shortly. I haven't gotten those out to everybody, but you'll be receiving delegate meetings and we'll vote on them on um, bank sometime coming up shortly. So I wanna do that. But uh, if you have any questions, contact another board member, contact me. Um, I'm crazy busy, but please um, consider joining the board. I think, I, I don't know why there's some people who are, you know, all of you are here on a Saturday. Uh, but we all have um, a commitment to work and make Denver a better city and make our neighborhoods a good city, a good neighborhood, and make sure that we're engaged with each other. So I encourage anybody who wants to be a board member, please, you know, please reach out to us because we need, yeah, we need, we need some new people on. So thank you very much. Troopty, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so for membership, obviously, um, you know, there, we have elections coming up uh, next month at the next month delegate meeting, correct? It's the, right. Uh, so second Saturday, March. And right now we've got about 45% of uh, our 2020 members who've renewed. So I will be reaching out to uh, the other folks uh, just to send them another reminder and, or possibly by phone, uh, both, both. The other thing I want, there's some question about um, how to be a delegate that I'm seeing. I, we see some new folks here. And in order for you to be a delegate with Inc., your RNO needs to be a registered neighborhood organization with the city. And you have to be an Inc. paid member. Uh, and then you can designate two delegates from your RNO. So if those two things are not true, um, you, you won't be a delegate and you won't be able to vote uh, for the board or any 
issues, any resolution. So um, just a clarification for a couple of new folks. Um, let's see, uh, we're looking for, we're, and I think we covered this with the diversity piece, we're also looking for folks with contacts in some of the neighborhoods that are underrepresented or have not engaged with Inc. Um, and, and possibly even folks in areas where there isn't an RNO yet, and we could help them go through that process or talk to them about some of the benefits of being an RNO and the representation. So we're looking for folks who have contacts on the west side or any of the areas that we don't have currently representa uh, representation. So if you know people, let me know so I can kind of make a phone call and reach out and talk to them. Um, and I see folks, you know, uh, putting chat. Montbello, I think we definitely have some folks. Um, you know, the Southwest Denver is definitely an area uh, for us right now. And we're targeting that at, for this year as kind of making an effort to target folks in that area and that region to, to outreach, again, lend support, waive membership fees if they don't have a process right now, help them become an RNO. So if you know folks in, the West Southwest Denver. Let us know. Um, this is for everyone. We're you know we've been discussing this as a board as well. So again, um, looking for diversity, looking to engage more folks. Any questions about that? And if anybody wants to be on the membership committee, <laughs> feel free to reach out. We're always looking for people to do some of the work that we do, and a lot of that is really the relationship building. Um, and you know, making contact. So I think that's one of the bigger, more important things for us to focus on for 2021. And as far as VP, um, yes, I am being pulled in a lot of different directions. I will continue to be a delegate for my RNO and I will continue to lead membership uh, committee unless somebody wants to, you know, do that. I, you know, co-lead it, you could do it instead of me. Um, but uh, I'll continue doing that for uh, at least one more year. So through next year, next uh, election. So, but I'm always looking for volunteers there as well. All right, great, thank you. I'm gonna try and share my screen again, as long as I get the right thing and you don't, yep, there it is. All right, so um, again, uh, some of our goals are here. Our mission is on the website. I had a request for that, but I also wanted to make sure that um, I wanted to put up the ground rules just briefly for a minute. So everybody, if you hadn't seen it before, these are our ground rules for kind of going forward with when we have um, presenters and just to make sure that people are respectful of other participants and in the chat. So I just wanna put that up again and make sure people see that I want to make sure that people understand that INC is, you know, we're trying to be inclusive and open to all people in the city of Denver, not just homeowners, but renters and everyone who is a resident of the city and, you know, those who work for the city of Denver also. So I want to put that up briefly. But I also want to say uh, we might start a little early. Um, and if, um, and if Erica, you're on still, I think I saw you earlier, if you're okay. Um, I wanted just to do a brief introduction. We've had Erica Rogers, a policy analyst from Excise and License come and present previously. She's here with us today to present on, there's new changes with marijuana legislation. I don't wanna go into you know, all of that because I wanna give it to her, but, um, but I wanna say that we have changes. And then we also have a couple of other people who will comment and, and give some perspective afterward. Um, and then we'll have questions uh, afterward. So if any of the presenters are okay with questions, you know, during the, their presentations, you know, they will let you know, but typically it's preferable that they're held to the end. Also, if you put it in the chat, um, sometimes the presenters as our last meeting, they, they, they're not always savvy and know how to read a chat. I'm sure Erica does, um, but it's hard when you're presenting to read the chat too. So we wanna make sure that you hold on to your questions if you can until the end, and then we will call on people who raise their hands or questions in the chat, all right? So um, Erica, I'm gonna stop sharing. And Maggie, um, can you let Erica share? Erica, are you there? Yeah, yes, thank you, Loretta. Um, 
Molly Duplashane is also here. Um, oh, she's Molly's here. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hey. So I will share my screen and I'll let Molly um, get us started. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having us. I am Molly Duplashane. I am uh, the Deputy Director for of Policy for the Department of Excise and Licenses. Um, and as Loretta said, we are here to talk to you this morning about um, some a package of legislation that we are bringing to City Council um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and so I will let Erica run through the whole proposal and I will just warn you it's a lot of information because um, there is a lot of changes and it's just a big topic. Um, but um, uh, just wanted to kind of highlight and give you the high level picture. Our goal really, um, and I don't know, Erica, if you want to go ahead and go to maybe the third slide, I think we'll just, I'll just, I'll just do this one real quick and then I'll hand it over to you. Um, just wanted to kind of mention our overall goals and what we are trying to do with this package of legislation. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty big rewrite to the marijuana regulations and the marijuana code for Denver. Um, and so when we took a look at this, it's something we've been working on for a couple of years, really. Um, and so first of all, we just took a look at everything with an equity lens at the center of it all. But had a couple of other goals for implementation around um, making sure we were striking the right balance between providing opportunities to businesses and consumers while maintaining the strong protections that we've had in Denver for, around marijuana for both communities and neighborhoods as well as youth. And so those were all the different kind of things that we were working towards and the different um, priorities that we were trying to balance. And so um, We'll be, I'll let Erica go through it all and I'll stay, stay stick on for questions and to hear the discussion um, and look forward to hearing your feedback. All right. Thanks, Molly. Um, as she mentioned, it's gonna be a lot. So if you have questions, I, I can't see the chat while I'm presenting, but um, you know, feel free to either put them in there and we'll get to the, them to the end or like Loretta said, wait till the end. Um, raise your hand and we can, you know, make sure we get some questions answered. So um, one of the first things to put out there is that this is going to be a package of three different bills. So um, they're meant to be read together. They're meant to be considered as a package. Um, certain things are in certain bills, but um, this chart here shows you which items and which topics are covered mm -hmm. by each bill. Please the, the biggest one is, the, sorry, the biggest the bill of the muffins wake is, you up. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. yeah, that's a nice thing to wake up to, isn't it? So the first bill is going to be an omnibus bill. Um, it's going to have most of the information I mean, in an INC meeting. that we're making changes to. And I believe somebody's got their microphone on, if you wouldn't mind muting yourself. Thank you. And hey, Erica, you might want to share your screen, like make it the full screen, because right now we can see like the presenter. Oh, um, okay, let me, now let's see if I can do this. I did this the other day. Um, let's see. Is that better, Molly? Okay, great. Um, so as I mentioned, three bills. The first one is the omnibus bill and it makes most of the changes. Um, so the, most of them will be there. Um, it'll cover the topics of social equity. It will um, address existing licenses that you're familiar with. And it will also um, address the topic of marijuana delivery. The second and third bill um, are a little bit shorter. The second bill um, would be to enact what's called a marijuana hospitality program. So this is um, in line with the state's marijuana consumption program. Um, we currently have a cannabis consumption program in Denver that was voted on by the voters. So the second bill would enact the um, you know, state program with the state parameters, and then the third one would repeal that um, pilot program bill um, that was voted on by citizens. So we'll go through each of the bills. 
um, and each of the topics in just a second. But first I wanted to go over, um, oh, if I can, there we go. Um, how we got here, just a little bit of background because I know we always get a lot of questions about any outreach we've done or you know, who we've talked to, who's asked for things um, and, and how we got started. So I'll, I'll go through some of that background first. Um, we've done a ton of outreach um, on marijuana topics, as you all can imagine, um, through various channels and um, both local and nationwide. So we have held um, interjurisdictional meetings to talk about marijuana equity, marijuana regulation, um, both at our annual uh, Marijuana Regulators Management Symposium. So um, we get together with regulators from across the country, either who are already regulating cannabis or are who are looking to regulate cannabis. Um, we've done interjurisdictional calls with them for several years now, just to keep each other up to speed on um, what the different states, what different cities are doing. We've also participated heavily in the uh, State Marijuana Enforcement Division's rulemaking work group. So anytime the legislature passes a new marijuana bill, um, if the uh, state rulemaking authority needs to make those rules, um, we participate in those uh, open meetings and provide feedback about what's operational from a city perspective. Um, we've also participated in local discussions with uh, marijuana equity groups uh, like the Black Cannabis Equity Initiative, the Color of Cannabis, and the Denver branch of the NAACP. In 2019, we held some informal community sessions um, with a group called the Cannabis Community Equity Committee um, to get some initial feedback on what other jurisdictions were doing, um, which ideas sounded feasible for Denver, um, and to get just some initial thoughts. Um, in the past couple of years, we've also met with dozens of interested citizens who just called or emailed us and said they wanted to talk about it. They wanted to share their thoughts. Um, and so we've always been open and continue to be open to talking to anyone who's interested. In addition to that outreach, we've also done a lot of research, um, including um, with the help of our interjurisdictional partners, monitoring, analyzing, and comparing different equity programs in other cities and states, uh, specifically in marijuana licensure. Um, we've been following uh, court cases and outcomes um, to try to, you know, it, it's nice for once in Denver to not be the first jurisdiction doing this. And so it's um, been great to watch other jurisdictions try different things and see what works and what isn't working. In addition to that research, we also commissioned a marijuana business and employment opportunity study. Um, that was um, something that we were interested in doing to inform our policy decisions with data. Um, so we conducted that study uh, in 2019 and it was released last year in 2020. It contained um, information garnered from informant interviews with business leaders, employees, owners, social justice advocates, um, city and state staff, related associations, and um, individuals. We also had um, three stakeholder sessions that had 35 participants, give or take each. And then we had two larger public forums where we talked about some broad ideas and got feedback, and each of those had about 100 participants. Um, in addition to get some of that data, we um, did an online survey that had 300 plus respondents. So if anyone is interested, I've linked that um, study. You can click on that link and um, it will take you to the um, study. I've also shared this slide deck with Loretta, so um, she will be able to get it out to anyone who's interested. After doing um, some of that outreach and research, we started working on legislative planning uh, last year. So we convened um, what we call our marijuana licensing work group, and it had um, social equity experts, it had city and state agency representatives, we had elected officials, law enforcement, um, folks from the industry, folks from Smart Colorado, um, home delivery industry representatives, RNO members. So it was um, a pretty diverse group that um, gave us some really great feedback. We talked about delivery, hospitality, equity other code changes broadly. Um, and we, you know, in our first four meetings did a lot of question asking um, and folks were able to, you know, make public comments either in response to those questions, they could bring up new topics, um, but all of them were, 
you know, recorded and posted publicly on our website. Again, if you're interested in hearing any of that background discussion, um, those are all posted on our website. So using that input, um, we uh, developed some high level conceptual proposals. We brought that back to the um, work group after a couple of months of, of thinking through all of their suggestions and comments. Um, and we used that input to um, start the next phase, which was the ordinance drafting. Um, so we released the first draft of the ordinances on December 7th. Um, you know, we put those on our website as well. And then we had a few, I think we've had four stakeholder feedback sessions in December and January. Um, those are open to anyone uh, uh, on Zoom, available to attend. And then we started also meeting with city council members um, to talk through the same ideas and proposals with them to get their thoughts. Um, so this is where um, with the letter from I came you in, um, and we were closing that window on feedback for um, Christmas Eve, 1968. Hello. I mean, if somebody is on, on Apollo 8 orbited. Okay, we're getting background noise. You need to mute. We're hearing something about Apollo 8, which is not our presentation. So maybe very interesting, but can you please mute? Thanks. Thanks, Loretta. Um, so we we used a lot of the feedback. We got um, a, a lot of feedback on that first draft, a lot of useful feedback, and we've made some changes. And we just released those second drafts on February 10th. Um, so that those are all on our website. Um, we have some slides that um, show the differences between that first draft and that second draft. If, um, I know Christine is one who loves to dig into the nitty gritty details. So if you're like her and you wanna do that, those are all um, available. Um, but this presentation today will kind of be a combination. It'll kind of go over what the proposal is as it stands today um, so we can get your feedback. So um, we will continue to take written comments until March 2nd. Um, and you know, we will continue to take comments until we actually you know, introduce the bill for consideration at city council. Um, the sooner we get it, the more time we can you know, have to, to incorporate it. But um, once then it gets introduced at city council, we can kind of go over what the next steps are at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will jump into the first bill, which is the omnibus bill. As I mentioned, it's got the most um, information in it. And so it does four key things um, that we'll talk about um, today. So the first is it's gonna focus on equity. Um, you know, in the city, we talk about using an equity lens um, when we're making policy decisions. And so um, this bill really revises our marijuana code provisions using that equity lens um, and creating opportunities for certain social equity applicants. So we'll talk about that. The next thing it does is um, it tries to um, reduce bureaucratic red tape by aligning with the state, um, the state laws, the state rules, wherever possible. And then um, in a few situations where we think there are stronger local protections needed, um, we have added those and those will be the areas where we'll differ from the state. So throughout the presentation, you'll see a little blue star. Um, those are areas where we are um, you know, enacting stronger local protections than the state has on the books. Um, another key thing that the bill does is, is that it reimagines how licenses, marijuana licenses would be distributed. So currently we have a system that um, caps the number of locations in the city for two types of uh, licenses and then requires um, a lottery system for distributing any available licenses. Um, we want to reimagine how that looks and replace that with um, some licensing exclusivity periods for those social equity applicants. So we'll dig into that as well. Finally, in this bill, um, it authorizes marijuana delivery program, um, again, with exclusive opportunities for social equity applicants. Um, and the, the reason for this is to expand access for especially patients and homebound residents who have been asking us to do this for um, several years. So we'll talk about each of those in depth, um, starting with the proposed equity program. So I think the first question most of you would have is, what is a social equity applicant? Who would qualify? And then, you know, once you qualify, what what opportunities are available to you. So this slide here looks at who qualifies as a social equity applicant. 
Um, we are looking at, again, aligning with the state. This is the definition that the state of Colorado has adopted for social equity applicants um, to access state benefits. Um, and the first and foremost thing is that you have to be a Colorado resident. So it's only open to Colorado residents. Um, and the, if you're a Colorado resident, um, you can't have ever had a marijuana license revoked in the past. So if you were somebody who got a license early on and you weren't following the rules and your license was revoked, you don't qualify for this program. So if you're a resident who has never had their license revoked, um, you have to meet one of three social equity criteria outlined by the state. So the state has identified these um, criteria based on um, a lot of input from equity um, experts and social justice advocates, um, ec economics experts um, uh, from the state to determine folks who may have had um, you know, a disproportionate negative impact and barriers that they faced in entry to the marijuana industry. Um, so those three qualifying criteria, you could meet any one of them. The first one is a residency location requirement. So if you lived within a, a, either an opportunity zone or a disproportionate impacted area for at least 15 years between 1980 and 2010, that's one way to qualify. And those two um, types of areas are defined by uh, either the state um, Office of Economic Development or the State Marijuana uh, Enforcement Division. So if you want more information on areas that qualify, just let me know. Another way to qualify is whether um, the applicant themselves or their immediate family member, um, say a parent or sibling, was arrested, convicted, or suffered some sort of civil asset forfeiture due to a marijuana offense, um, ostensibly you know, from the war on drugs. The third way you could qualify is if your applicant, yourself, household, did not exceed 50% of the state median income um, measured by the number of people in your house. So again, that's a, a state formula. There's a chart. Um, if you're interested, I can send it to you. So those, if you meet one of those criteria, um, you meet that third arrow there. So if you can say, if you can check the box on all of those things, you may qualify as a social equity applicant. So um, what that means is that to gain licensure benefits through the programs, you would um, have to be applying to own at least 51% of the marijuana business um, license that you're applying for. In Denver, um, we'll get into this with our exclusivity periods, but um, that social equity applicant would have to remain a majority owner un uh, until 2027, or um, if they are not the majority owner, they would have to um, ensure that the license is held by a majority of social equity applicants who can meet these criteria. So applicants who meet the criteria um, would have a few opportunities in Denver. Um, at the state level, being a social equity applicant um, qualifies you to participate in what they call an accelerator program. Um, it looks like mentorship through an existing licensee. Um, and so that's one opportunity that they have at the state. And in Denver, these are the um, opportunities that we would be looking at for equity applicants. So the first is a period of licensing exclusivity where we would only distribute most of our license types to social equity applicants uh, for a period of six years. Um, so it would go through 2027. So any uh, retail stores, um, transporters, cultivations, manufacturing, and um, the social consumption licenses that we'll talk about, which are called hospitality, um, all of those would be reserved only for social equity applicants for six years. In addition to that, um, the delivery program that we'll talk about that we would like to opt into, um, we would make that um, opportunity exclusive to uh, social equity transporters so that existing stores um, would have to contract with a new social equity applicant in order to conduct their deliveries uh, for a period of three years. Finally, one of the biggest challenges that we hear um, and have heard from the social justice community is that um, barriers to entry are, are hard to overcome. And one of those barriers um, for folks who would meet social equity applicant criteria is the cost of entry. It is very expensive to um, start a marijuana business and um, to have that access to capital and to fundraising and to investors. 
And so um, one piece that we have included in the proposal is that we would waive application fees for our social equity applicants um, as a startup cost. And they would see a 50% um, reduction in their license fee. So that's the fee they pay annually for those stores, transporters, cultivations, and manufacturing. And then for the new license and permit types, that's the, the social consumption and delivery um, that would also be uh, available exclusively to social equity applicants. Those would have a low, um, a lower licensing fee than the existing um, licenses to ensure that um, it's, a, it's an um, equitable entry point. And then one thing to note is that the bills also require our department to report to city council um, with those six and three year exclusivity periods, we would be required to report on that, provide data um, and provide some sort of maybe recommendation on what would happen after those um, exclusivity periods expire so that um, city council can consider that before the program ends. Some other um, things that we wanted to mention, um, you might not see these um, in the bill language, but they're more programmatic um, opportunities um, for support that we would offer to social equity applicants. Um, as I mentioned, that state accelerator program, um, this, our, our proposal allows for entry um, into the market through that state program. Um, and then some things that we would be providing are process navigation, which we currently do for existing licenses, but would um, offer, especially for social equity applicants who, you know, this may be their first time navigating city processes, or it may be even a neighborhood um, looking to work with social equity applicants. Um, so making sure that we're providing those resources for process navigation and education um, in the communities for the applicants and for the neighborhoods. Um, another thing that we are looking at that isn't in the bill, but um, that we're exploring is the opportunity for um, local grant or loan programs that um, could help social equity applicants access capital or you know, be in touch with funding support um, that you know, they may not have had the same access to as some of our early adopters. And that would look something like um, in the Office of Economic Development, um, similar loan and grant programs for small businesses that currently exist. So the next piece we'll talk about is um, kind of the basics of the new code, some changes that you will see in the language in addition to the equity um, provisions. So first and foremost, um, the big thing that you'll see is the bill is called a repeal and replace. So it will be all uh, new language um, and it relocates. Um, currently we have a medical code that's in chapter 24 of the uh, Denver Municipal Code and we have retail provisions in chapter six. Um, this is similar to how the state did things at the very beginning. Um, they had a medical code and a retail code and the state has since moved to a combined code instead of repeating provisions for medical and retail, um, you know, just outlining what applies to every license type and only pointing out where things may be different for medical or retail if necessary. So we are going to follow suit with that um, and relocate all of our marijuana provisions to be in one place, chapter six. Um, and you'll see that that is, um, I, I think will be more streamlined. Another thing that we're gonna do is align with the state on terminology. So for example, the state refers to um, a location that sells marijuana, right? Um, as either a retail store or a medical store. And originally we had referred to them as a retail marijuana store and a medical marijuana center. Some places were still calling themselves dispensaries from you know prior to the legalization uh, when we only had medical marijuana. So making sure that um, our bill is consistent with the state terminology, um, always calling the medical store or retail store so that everybody knows um, you know, what license and what business type those provisions are referring to. And then, as I mentioned, we um, looked through some of our existing provisions and practices um, and tried to evaluate them using an equity lens to revise them so that they could either you know, update or clarify the requirements and restrictions. Um, so we'll see some of those. Now you might be asking, what is an equity lens? What does that mean to evaluate policy with an equity lens? So um, our um, Office of Racial Justice and Social Innovation, I think RSJI is what it's called. Um, they have advised us 
um, this is kind of the, the standard set of questions that when you're making decisions and when we were making um, decisions in our um, office um, about each decision point, asking ourselves, you know, who benefits from this decision? What are the associated burdens or unintentional impacts on any given demographic? Um, what are the disparities that are addressed by the decision? And then how can we document our action steps so that we can correct any burden of unintentional impact connected to those key decisions? So these were the questions we were asking ourselves um, and continue to ask ourselves as we evaluate um, decision points. You know, do we go this route? Do we go that route? Um, if we go this route, do we take, you know, path A or path B? Um, and so I'm sure a lot of you can appreciate that um, as you're making those tough decisions, that's not usually a question of right and wrong. It's right for which group versus right for which group and balancing that with Denver values um, and goals. So that's what we mean when we say an equity lens. So some of the changes um, that are in the omnibus bill, you'll see uh, the first is kind of that distribution um, mechanisms for how we distribute marijuana licenses. So Currently, the, there is a mechanism that limits the number of locations in the, uh, that may be licensed. And then there's a prescribed method for how those licenses are um, given out or approved. Currently, the um, limiting mechanism is a cap on stores and cultivation. So um, locations where you can purchase marijuana or locations where you can grow marijuana. Um, and then the method for distributing licenses um, under that cap is an annual lottery that's open to any applicant. And so when we were reviewing these um, mechanisms, we were noticing that they um, favored luck and they favored um, savviness, right? Um, so people who had access to resources, you know, who were, um, you know, had, had the historical advantage to be able to, to navigate these systems were the ones who were going to benefit. And so rather than have a system that does that, we're proposing um, you know, a limit on the number of licenses using that social equity applicant exclusivity, not just for stores and grows, but for most of our licenses. Um, and then rather than an annual lottery um, where even somebody who you know, had everything lined up, who was ready to go, may not be able to get a license because there's a limited amount, um, the method for distributing licenses um, would be a year round application period, but only for that limited applicant pool. So it wouldn't be open to everybody. It would only be open to those folks who may need, um, you know, the year round time to be able to get things like a lease in place or funding in place and, you know, aren't being rushed to um, an annual event. We don't do that for any other of our license types. Um, so it seemed like an unfair burden uh, for this license type. Um, there's some also neighborhood and youth protections in the bill that um, I definitely wanted to highlight today. So in the current marijuana code, there is a protection for um, no new stores, no new cultivations in the top five most saturated neighborhoods. So the neighbor, the five neighborhoods, statistical neighborhoods in Denver that had the most stores and the most cultivations couldn't get new stores or cultivations. We want to keep that protection in place, but we want to improve on it um, just a bit in the proposal. So, um, for example, if there is a tie um, for two neighborhoods that are both in, you know, the fifth place, um, they would both be protected. So that's clarified in the proposal. And then not just new stores and cultivations, but what we noticed is that, you know, people can transfer their location. They can move their, their storefront or their grow. And so any transfers would also be prohibited into those um, saturated neighborhoods. So it's not just new applicants who would be prohibited from opening, it would also be transferred locations. Um, another feature is that needs and desires hearing. Um, that's again, something that we want to keep and improve on. Um, currently the code um, only allows for in-person hearings. Um, but with our hearing policies and procedures, this is something that you won't see in the bill language, but that would be part of the overall proposal um, that we would address through a programmatic um, end is to allow for the continuation of the virtual hearings that we've been testing out uh, through COVID. So um, if you have feedback on how those virtual hearings have gone or have been going, please, please, please feel free to reach out. There's no deadline on this. 
Um, we are always taking feedback. We actually just um, took it some feedback from, I think, Brune, B-R-U-N, um, RNO to um, improve um, the opportunity for folks to object at the end of the hearing. So those are suggestions we're always open to. There is no deadline for that um, continuous improvement, but ensuring that virtual hearings um, can be an option moving forward and not just temporarily. The other piece that would improve the hearing process is um, I think a lot of you might be familiar with the community engagement plan that's required from uh, marijuana applicants. We are looking to improve that into what we're calling a social impact plan. Um, it would cover more topics and it would be something that um, would hopefully be a better tool that RNOs could use um, when they show up at that hearing. So um, a couple of ways that will happen, it would be required for all licensees and it would be sent with, with the hearing notification packet. So the um, email that the RNOs get currently, um, that social impact plan would be in there. And um, we're gonna provide a template for our applicants so that all of those plans would look the same. You won't have to navigate different formats from different applicants trying to find the same information. It would all be set up in the same way, much like your utility bill comes in the same format every single month. So you know exactly where to look for you know, the different things you need to check. In addition to the engagement with the local neighborhoods, these social impact plans would also require applicants to talk about um, any practices they have for diversity and inclusion in hiring and employment, as well as environmental sustainability, things that we know neighborhoods care about. And then they would have to provide specific metrics that they're using to measure the success of those goals so that, you know, it can't be vague, it can't be, um, you know, fluffy. It would be something that actually means something to the neighborhood that they can read and say, oh, that makes sense to me. Those would have to be posted publicly for um, folks to access. And every year upon renewal, the applicants would have to update that plan and report out on the goals, um, how they did on their self-described goals from the year prior. So if they said they were going to do X, Y, Z, you know, whatever, whatever it is using whatever metrics, they would have to report out on that so the neighborhood could see um, you know, oh, this is a this is somebody who did what they said they were going to do, which um, you know, I think that's a feature that a lot of our marijuana licensees don't get recognized for, um, that they do often meet those goals that they set for themselves. And so, you know, making that information more accessible and more available um, will help decisions being made in hearings, whether it's a new hearing or whether it's a renewal hearing. Um, and finally, uh, youth protections. Um, these are a, a feature that our director is, you know, very strongly can, you know, on that um, advertising, location, zoning, and proximity restrictions. Um, a lot of those are in place to protect youth and to um, ensure that we don't see a negative impact on youth perceptions about marijuana and youth usage of marijuana. So. Um, a lot of those will either remain or be strengthened. So we'll go over those. Um, here's kind of what I talked about with the social impact plan and the streamlining of virtual hearings. Um, another thing that um, you'll see in the bill is in the renewal hearing standards. Um, the first bill listed a few things that we wanted to be specific about. Um, but in the updated bill, we have um, made the language more inclusive of all of the different opportunities and all of the different circumstances under which the director may set a renewal hearing. So um, if you're interested in what all of those are, this is something that we would definitely do some RNO education and outreach about um, to be able to know when can I request a renewal hearing, um, under what circumstances, what types of um, you know, what are, what are the standards for the director either denying or approving that renewal of an existing licensee? Um, so that's something that we'll be working on. And if you're interested in um, weighing in on or providing feedback, you know, feel free to reach out to us and I would definitely love um, your input. Here are those youth protection regulations in a little more detail. So um, we are going to maintain our current advertising restrictions and um, see that star there, that's somewhere that we're gonna diverge from the state um, who has um, created this expansion on branding um, that we are not gonna be opting into, except for in a few circumstances um, for consumer goods and apparel. 
Um, so we thought that was a, a good balance without allowing um, the outdoor advertising on billboards and things like that that we have not permitted to date. When it comes to density, the um, kind of how clustered the um, locations are to each other. Um, we're going to maintain our prohibition, like I mentioned, on new store or cultivation locations or those transferred um, into those five most saturated neighborhoods. We're going to maintain the director's ability to consider density of outlets when she's issuing or denying a license and then maintaining a thousand foot buffer between stores um, so that they don't cluster because we know that has an effect on youth perceptions and usage. Proximity is a little bit different than density. It, um, it's, it's to measure the, um, how close a particular store or location is to other types of things, um, not necessarily other marijuana locations. Um, so we're gonna maintain our proximity restrictions for all of our license types, all the marijuana license types. These are um, pretty strong when compared with either tobacco or alcohol. Um, so we, we have a chart at the end um, that I'll put up but we are going to adjust the way that we measure proximity um, for certain things like drug and alcohol oops, treatment facilities, city recreation centers, and outdoor pools. And the reason for this is to just um, align with the intent of the proximity restrictions and create a more fair, equitable way of measuring. So um, rather than measuring to the edge of the property that's listed um, for that use, um, we'll be measuring to the building, which is on par for how we measure um, the other uh, protected uses. And what it does is it ensures that, you know, for example, a city recreation center in, in a dense area of town um, has the same protections as a city recreation center in a less dense area of town. So um, we think that will be a fairer way to measure. Other changes that you'll see um, to the omnibus are um, hours of operation for stores. We will be aligning with the state, allowing them to operate from 8 a.m. to midnight. Um, we are adding some safety requirements though. Um, one of those is a requirement for stores to secure any product in a safe or vault um, overnight to deter burglaries and ensure that if a burglary um, does occur, that you know a, a a burglar would uh, make off with less product that may be um, diverted to the black market or to youth or you know to places that we don't want to see it go um, if that does occur. Another safety requirement that is in the updated bill draft um, is to prohibit drive up, walk up, curbside delivery services um, that are currently um, allowed for by state rule um, due to the emergency rule. And these were put in place to allow obviously um, some options for social distancing during COVID-19 um, in order to ensure that you know, people had different options and they didn't have to go into say small stores. Um, but when the state rule, being clear that when these state emergency rules um, expire that those things would not no longer be per, uh, permitted. And then you'll see, um, this is you know, more administrative, but increasing some of our fees um, for transfer of locations, modification of premises and transfer of ownerships. Um, these are things that applicants and licensees have to apply for before they do. They have to be approved by the department. And so um, just making sure that we're covering our costs um, for the work that we do processing those applications. So the last piece of the omnibus bill, um, as I mentioned, it's a long bill, is the delivery program. So it um, would propose that we opt in to a program to allow marijuana delivery. So some of the basics, um, because this would be totally new, um, this was approved by the state in 2019. Um, they have um, a pretty strict set of laws and rules. If you're interested in reading those state rules, and laws, um, you know, I can certainly send those to you. Um, and these are things that would be uh, features that, you know, either are incorporated by state law or that we would add, um, again, for, for stronger local protections. So um, a customer or patient has to be 21 or older to receive deliveries. And um, in Denver, we've added a requirement in our proposal that um, delivery drivers would be required to use an ID scanner to verify the customer's age um, before they hand them that product. Deliveries could occur um, in the same time frame that the state allows between 8 a.m. and midnight. This aligns with the store hours of operations. Um, 
you know, so it's standard across the board. And then the limits on product that can be delivered are um, either, depending on medical or retail, um, set by state um, for both flour or concentrate or um, edible products. A big question that I'm sure a lot of you are curious about, where can marijuana delivery occur? Where is it prohibited? Um, so marijuana delivery um, is open to private residences in Denver um, or a private residence in, you know, a city or, or county outside of Denver, um, only if that city or county has affirmatively voted to allow marijuana delivery. So if a, um, if a city hasn't affirmatively opted in, um, they can't receive deliveries. So within the city, um, uh, there's quite a, a long list of places that delivery is prohibited. So um, any premises located either at a school or on the campus uh, of an institute of higher education, so colleges and universities, um, any premises on those um, is prohibited, any premises on public property, and then any commercial property like offices or retail space. Um, and then the state also has a provision that um, deliveries cannot be made to a consumer or a private residence where that delivery person knows or reasonably, sh reasonably should know that that consumer or private residence has already received um, a delivery during that same business day. So that's to prevent um, people from getting around those product limits. Those are all set by state. And then additionally in Denver, we're also gonna add to that list um, that our proposal also prohibits delivery to a drug or alcohol treatment facility for obvious reasons. So some of the safety regulations uh, for the drivers, um, this is a question we get a lot of con concern about, you know, the drivers and the communities they'll be in. Um, the state requires video surveillance to record the uh, marijuana storage compartment within the vehicle as well as the front view of the vehicle. And that footage has to be retained for a minimum of 40 days. So if anything were to happen, there's video footage and surveillance required. There's also limits on the total amount of product that any one vehicle can have in it at any given time. Um, they have different limits for enclosed vehicles versus non-enclosed vehicles. Um, the enclosed vehicles um, in Denver, we wanna make it stricter then the state, um, the state allows up to $10,000 worth of retail value of marijuana to be um, in, the, in the car or in the vehicle. Uh, but in Denver, we would half that. So it would not be able to contain more than $5,000. And then non-enclosed vehicles would align with the state. They could not contain more than $2,000. So um, those are the limits. Um, additionally, we are um, requiring delivery drivers to keep their records and receipts in the vehicle so that, you know, if they are stopped by an enforcement officer, um, that enforcement officer could clearly see um, records um, to determine if anything um, nefarious is going on. Now, when it comes to getting a delivery permit as part of our licensing program, um, only um, two types of licenses could apply to get this permit. So either um, a medical or retail marijuana store, um, so a, a brick and mortar storefront, or a medical or retail marijuana transporter. So um, a transporter is an individual uh, license that's non-transferable um, that would you know, allow um, some opportunity for somebody who didn't have maybe the resources to you know, establish an entire brick and mortar to be able to engage in this. So. Um, this is that exclusivity piece that I mentioned earlier, and it's a bit um, nuanced, so if you don't get it right away, that's okay. Feel free to ask me questions. I, I live and breathe this every day, so I get it. It's it kind of com confusing if you're not. Um, so for a period of three years, only transporters would be able to conduct deliveries in Denver. So um, this, the transporters would have to qualify as a social equity applicant, that criteria we went over earlier. And then they would have to obtain a delivery permit um, to be able to, you know, get the vehicles and drive that product from the store to the customer. Now, stores that would supply the marijuana uh, through the transporters would also have to get a delivery permit, but they would not be able to conduct the deliveries on their own behalf until uh, 2024. So that's something different in Denver's proposal, um, and that would be. Um, 
the reason behind this is to give social equity applicants rather than existing licensed stores who were uh, more than likely an early adopter, um, the opportunity to um, create a, a name for themselves in this space, um, providing patient access um, and things like that. The permit fees, if anyone's interested, um, the application fee would be $500 waived for social equity applicants. The license fee annually would be $2,000 and it would cost $1,000 to apply. Um, for example, if a store had a delivery permit and they wanted to move, um, they would have to transfer that location. That would be $1,000. And if they wanted to transfer ownership, it would be $250. So we have made it through um, the very long first bill and the other two will fly. And then I promise I will get to questions. Um, so the next piece of the proposal is a hospitality bill for social consumption. So um, it would al align with the marijuana state code again to create um, a hospitality program that allows for lawful marijuana consumption establishments. And these would have smoking and vaping options, which our current proposal does not have. Um, one piece of this that our director felt very strongly about is that um, in shifting from our existing framework to the state framework, um, we wanted to continue to protect youth and make sure that we were thoughtful about how we made this shift. So um, just for some information, there are a couple different, there's two different license types when it comes to social consumption that the state authorized. And there's three different models for how that could look. So the first license type is a hospitality establishment. Um, that's a, um, a location where it's bring your own only and there's no sales permitted um, at that location. And, the, and there's two different ways that could look. It could be brick and mortar with a permanent license premises um, like that darker green, or it could be a mobile license premises on that lighter green. Uh, but both of those would um, be bring your own only, uh, no sales. And we, um, we have one existing license that would fit into the dark green uh, uh, category. And we have a couple of operators who um, would likely fit into the uh, light green category. The yellow category on the right is a different type of license that's a hospitality and sales. So that can't be mobile, it has to be permanent and it would allow for limited sales, um, single servings uh, ish um, and you could not bring your own um, and there are some extra restrictions. So we'll kind of go through um, what that means. But these are all authorized by uh, the state. So some big questions, you know, who could enter these establishments um, and patrons have to be 21 or older, no matter the type of hospitality establishment. Um, the operating hours for these are similar to, you know, on-premise consumption for alcohol, so 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. And then um, the methods of consumption, um, this is the, the key change is that um, the state would allow us to opt into an exemption from the um, Colorado Clean Indoor Air Act to allow for indoor smoking and vaping um, as long as there are proper odor and ventilation controls in place um, to, to prevent uh, odor and ventilation from becoming a new or odor uh, from becoming a nuisance. So um, those are the state uh, restrictions. These are some additional requirements that we would enact in Denver in our proposal. Um, so one is regarding overlapping premises. So um, this is kind of a technical uh, restriction, but all types of hospitality establishments would be prohibited from um, overlapping with either a medical or retail marijuana store. They would have to be separate from that store, um, especially if they're gonna have sales um, so that, you know, that way they're separate locations, separate doors, things like that. Um, as far as odor control, an odor control plan would be required for all types of hospitality establishments, again, to ensure that the um, odor is not a nuisance to the surrounding neighborhood. And then all applicants for um, a hospitality license would have to undergo a needs and desires hearing, just, um, just like a uh, liquor license or an existing marijuana store license, um, unless the hospitality establishment is mobile because they wouldn't be a permanent fixture in any particular neighborhood. Um, however, they would all have to provide evidence of community support at the time of application 
Um, this is a feature of, of the existing I-300 um, where we only have one licensee, um, and it's a feature that we've borrowed for other license types as well. For the site requirements, um, the state does allow for indoor or outdoor consumption, but if it's outdoor, it has to be surrounded by um, a wall, a fence, a hedge, something that is site obscuring to the general public. Um, and also in Denver, of course, um, if there is going to be proposed outdoor consumption, they would have to comply with that Denver odor control plan, again, to ensure that it's not a nuisance. Another feature is that these um, hospitality establishments are allowed to be co-located with um, what's called an RFE, a retail food establishment, so a restaurant. Um, but it would have to be separated from the rest of the restaurant, again, by something that's site obscuring, a barrier, a secure door, um, and marijuana would not be allowed to be added to the food that is served in that retail food establishment. So um, it would have to be a specialty um, restaurant um, so some restaurants have a liquor license so that they can serve beer and things like that. Um, it would be similar, but with some, some added restrictions um, due to the, the effect of smoke. Um, again, the odor and ventilation plans still apply. So here are those proximity restrictions uh, that I mentioned, um, especially for the, con the consumption use. You'll see um, what we're proposing is in that first column with bolded it would be um, the same as the proximity restrictions that are um, in place for the, the pilot program, a thousand feet from schools, childcare facilities, city pools and rec centers, alcohol and drug treatment facilities, um, and then also adding a buffer from other hospitality establishments to um, get away from that clustering um, for its effect on youth perceptions. And as I mentioned earlier, this is stricter than what currently is in place for alcohol, tobacco, um, or bars um, as it exists. Those are, are set um, typically by state. Um, a couple other specifics for mobile hospitality. Um, those, if there is gonna be a mobile um, premises, it would have to have GPS tracking per the state. It would have to um, submit its route and uh, log that route with the department. And then in Denver, um, it would also not be permitted for that mobile vehicle to have any external markings, words, or symbols that would, you know, kind of constitute advertising of marijuana or marijuana consumption. And then the applicant would have to um, provide that route information um, if it's stopped and allowing consumption um, for any time more than 30 minutes. Um, for hospitality and sales, um, that as I mentioned, the, the sales limits would be uh, much less than what a store is allowed to sell. And as you can see, it would be limited to two grams of marijuana, half a gram of marijuana concentrate or products containing um, 20 milligrams of THC or less. Those are all set by state. These are the fees um, that would be associated with that license type. So a $1,000 one-time application fee, unless you're a social equity applicant, annual $2,000 fee, and then um, 1500, 250, and 300 for any of those um, transfer of location or ownership or modifying the premise. Finally, the last bill is short and sweet. It would repeal the um, existing um, uh, citizen initiated ordinance because if the second bill passes, um, this uh, provision, these provisions would be defunct. So um, it would only be considered after the uh, hospitality bill, um, if that is passed, um, and it would convert the existing DCA licenses into hospitality licenses. So just, you know, aligning them with that state framework. Um, and then they would have to, um, excuse me, lost my sound there. Um, the uh, DCA licenses who are converted uh, will be required either to have that permanent premises or um, mobile vehicle premises in line with state law. So that is a ton of information. I know you've all been patiently waiting to ask questions. Um, before we get to that, just a couple of next steps so that um, you know, you're aware of what your options are when it comes to weighing in. Um, so this is the typical city council process, um, just to give you all some, some insight. Um, as I mentioned, we will be taking feedback on the bill um, at the agency level until 
uh, March 2nd, which is when we have to submit the um, bill draft for consideration. That is when we are uh, presenting at the City Council Finance and Governance Committee. Um, that is a public meeting. There's time at the end for public comment. Um, after that public comment, the members of that committee vote on whether that bill goes to the full city council. Um, there's a, a formal step where that, you know, any bill that's passed out of committee gets read for the mayor and council. And then it's the bills considered by the full council at first reading and voted on at second reading. So that's kind of the, the general process. So um, there's opportunities to provide your feedback to us up until March 2nd. Um, that date is subject to change if, for example, the finance committee um, says, you know, hey, we've got something else to consider, you have to come later, uh, but it won't be any sooner than that. Um, and after that, then any feedback would be through the um, public legislative process um, with your city council members. There are a couple of other options um, if you want to learn more. Um, we're having another uh, stakeholder feedback session for the general public uh, next Wednesday from 5 to 7. I've added a little Zoom link there. It's also on our website. Um, that presentation will be a pretty deep dive into um, the nitty gritty changes from the first draft to the second draft for anyone who's following along. Uh, but there's also time for feedback at the end. If you're somebody who likes to write rather than speak, um, you can certainly send any written comments to us at marijuanainfo at denvergov.org. Um, we made a template if that is easier for you, but we um, will consider any comment that we get. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we'll consider those comments until we introduce the bill, but the sooner it's received, the more time we can have to consider. Um, if you want to request an individual meeting just to learn more or ask questions, I know I've done this with several RNOs or individual RNO members. Um, that's how you can reach us at marijuanainfo at denvergov.org. Or you can sign up for our bulletin if you're not already subscribed. Um, we always send out notifications of meetings, legislative actions, work groups, things like that. If so, if you're really interested in marijuana, um, definitely make sure that you're signed up for that. So at this point, I will stop sharing my screen and um, Loretta, however you want to um, divvy up the questions, um, just let me know. Okay, I know, and, and Molly, thank you so much. And Erica, thanks for presenting. Uh, Molly, thanks for answering some questions. Um, I know, let me go by in list of who has asked questions. I'm not gonna go through the questions because some of them may have been answered throughout the process, but I wanna make sure that we go there. Um, Miles, I'm gonna start with you. You were the first one with a couple of questions. Some of yours might've been answered, but why don't you go ahead and let's start with you. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting, I guess I just have a quick comment. Um, I, I wish maybe we had been more involved earlier in this process again I'll just talk about my experience with the process that the city basically talks to some people, does a little bit of outreach and comes up with a bill and then presents it. And then we just have this small window to actually understand what's being presented. And lately the city has been bundling all of these things together and it makes it incomprehensible to understand what's being proposed. And I, I can understand a lot of what's happening here and I can see where they're getting at. But some of the questions I have were, um, so the reasoning for this, it sounds like um, to allow more opportunities for people to use and access marijuana. And is this coming from a need from residents or is this coming from retail sites wanting to be able to sell it to people visiting and, and to create greater opportunities for them to do that. So it's kind of what is the genesis of this? And, and I understand it's under the, the equity piece. And I think that's more of a code word and you can pass anything with saying, oh, it's going to be equitable. Um, but it also sounds like you're also going to remove the caps on these businesses. And you're going to say you can only expand it into these other neighborhoods that don't have it. So it sounds like you're basically saying caps are removed. If you if you operate in one of these other neighborhoods, you can then increase and have more retail and, and do these things. 
th that's basically my comment. Thank you. So there's a couple different pieces in there and I'll try to get them all, but if I, if I forget one, I'll just have you remind me, but um, we got a lot of feedback and the state got a lot of feedback that led to the adoption of these license types in 2019. Um, advocates in Denver and statewide wanted opportunities for marijuana delivery and um, social consumption. Now, social consumption is something that the Denver voters already approved in um, 2016, I believe. So we've had that license type and this is just conforming with the um, rules and um, guidelines by state um, for what's what you know what opportunities are available um, so that it's less confusing. So that's the, the piece about social consumption has already been voted on by the voters um, and we're trying to you know remain in that uh, intent. Um, what we do, what we have heard from um, communities and concerned citizens, and I know you'll hear from Henny lastly as well, is that, um, you know, people want there to be designated spaces for folks who are going to be doing this to go do it so that it's not out in public, it's not out in the open, it's not exposing youth. Um, so that was a big reason for, you know, maintaining that opportunity um, that the voters had asked for. When it comes to delivery, um, we've heard a lot of patient advocates asking for um, options saying that, you know, I can get my prescription drugs delivered, people can get alcohol delivered, people can get pretty much anything delivered now that we're in COVID. Um, why is this the one thing that, you know, if I have seizures, I still have to find somebody to take me to a store to access the product. Um, why can't I get this delivered, like my arthritis medication or, you know, the cocktail that I want to make later. So um, that was um, a piece that we considered heavily as well, how to how to make that opportunity available for folks without um, expanding the framework too much. So I hope that answers your first question. Um, now I've forgotten your second question. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds like the licensing is removing the store caps and then is basically pushing new development into all the other neighborhoods for new licenses? So the caps um, would be removed as the mechanism for, you know, kind of limiting the, the amount of locations. However, um, you know, as, as many city council members have discussed on different, you know, taking different positions, um, there are other limits that still remain in place, um, such as the proximity restrictions, zoning restrictions, um, and um, prohibited uses of, of land. So there's, um, it's not, I don't think going to push, um, to, it, it's not going to open up a floodgate, um, so to speak, of, of business development into uh, other areas of the city. It is going to make a few additional locations available um, for those folks who are the social equity applicants rather than any applicant who would be able to get a license through the lottery. And, and if just a quick follow-up question, and, and I've seen this in a lot of the city plans, when it's presented- Miles, I want to I make sure oh, that other people okay. have the opportunity, and I, we can come back to you on your next question. But why don't we go ahead, and, and I, I'm sorry about that, I put it in the chat, and I hope you all saw that, but I want to go back to our presenters and make sure that the other people have the opportunity, and so then we'll get back to questions for everything, because that may help too. So the next person is presenting is from Smart Colorado, so please stay on the line, um, Erica and Molly, if you can, um, but um, uh, Henny Lasley, are you here? I'm here. Okay, great. Um, I don't know if you have something you want to share, but let's, why don't you go ahead? Sure. Good morning, everyone. Let me, I think, um, could the host please allow me to share my screen? You should be able to share. Thank you. Good morning on this cold February morning. Um, my name is Hannah Lastly. I'm one of the co-founders and executive director of a organization called Smart Colorado. We are in the process of transitioning our organization um, to be called One Chance to Grow Up. It's actually an initiative of Smart Colorado. 
because our mission is to focus on protections for youth since marijuana has been legalized and commercialized. So you'll see, you'll see us talk a little bit about One Chance and sometimes we call ourselves Smart Colorado. So um, we're just in a transition period. So um, just really quickly who we are and why we do what we do. Um, after the voters passed Amendment 64 in 2012, um, allowing for adult use, um, a task force came together by uh, then Governor Hickenlooper and at the time uh, when the task force that came together um, was looking at the implementation of the regulations, um, there was a concern from many parents that um, the, the, the impact on kids um, was, was really ranked last in terms of, of the priority um, for when it was time for the regulations to be put in place. And that was concerning because Colorado was the first to have ever done this. Um, so we felt like there needed to be a, an organized effort to make sure that, that kids were in the conversation. And um, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit, um, Denver-based organization. And um, we do not receive or apply for any marijuana tax revenues or accept money from the marijuana industry. We stand for kids and advocate for regulations that to, pr to protect them. We are not a, a repeal organization. We are not trying to undo the will of the voters. We're trying to make sure that there's education and information about impacts and potential um, public health and safety that we need to consider as, as um, a city and a state. So many of us have, um, <clears throat> just really quickly about us, many of us have kids or family members that have been ex um, impacted by uh, marijuana use. Um, we sp spend a lot of time educating citizens and policymakers about there's such a wide difference now between CBD and THC and products derived from hemp and what's actually out in the marketplace today and sold in our dispensaries every day. So a lot of what we do is education for policymakers, education for parents and trusted adults to make sure that it's known that the, the marijuana that many adults might have used as someone in the 60s or 70s or 80s is a much different uh, product than it is today from a uh, potency standpoint, but also methods of intake. And I'm really not gonna focus on that because um, what we're here to talk about is hospitality and delivery. Um, again, because we were the first, it just made, it just made for a, a wide gap in misperceptions and um, huge gaps in, of information. So again, just the, a little visual to show all the differences between products of today. So this map I show you because there was a lot of discussion and Erica, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, just to show again, just where, and it's a difficult slide to see um, on a Zoom call, but this does show where we have high concentrations of licenses and then it's overlapped by what are concerning um, statistics and indicators by the city with respect to the well child being indexed. So the areas of darker blue unfortunately have a very high concentration and we're really pleased to see that um, there's consideration to not continuing to oversaturate these particular neighborhoods. So just really quickly um, on, on Colorado youth um, and Denver youth, the numbers are pretty much in line with, with one another, but the big takeaways really for this morning is that while, um, while 20 percent of Colorado youth do use marijuana and reported it in the last 30 days, according to the Healthy Kids Colorado survey, about 50 percent of them are using high potent products, and that includes dabbing. And those are products that are sold every day in our, in our dispensaries. And that's concerning to us because of the, the fact that we were promised that marijuana and marijuana products would be kept out of the hands of kids. And that's quite frankly, not happening. Also just one other thing concerning from a citizen and community standpoint is that high schoolers are now reporting that they're twice as likely to drive high than they are driving after alcohol. So you can see that we have a very large um, education process ahead of us with respect to our kids because there's just this perception that it's safer to drive high and I know Truman's going to talk and he, he also could probably identify that that continues to be a problem in the adult space as well. 
So this is just a visual to show the different ways now that kids use marijuana. Um, the top line <clears throat> shows that, that there's a tendency towards more of the high potent products that are sold in disp dispensaries, including uh, vapor, vaped products, um, edible products, and there's a decline in the number of kids that are what we would just call smoking weed. So it's trending to how adults are using it and being able to purchase it on the commercial market. So to the, to the conversation at hand, um, full disclosure, Smart Colorado in 2019 um, opposed the bill that would allow for municipalities to opt in to social consumption or hospitality. Um, we did that because we're concerned, even though the data is not there for marijuana, it's pretty apparent that the more commercialization that, that is um, allowed with other substances, um, that it begins to normalize the behavior and lessens the perception of harm in the eyes of kids. And we've seen that with tobacco and alcohol. Um, but I really do want to commend the city of Denver and Ashley Kilroy and her staff, Molly Duplachain, and her tremendous team along with Erica um, at, in Excise and License to try to really strike the balance of protecting Denver youth from whatever impacts might actually occur. So we really wanna commend that there's still going to be a distance requirement from where kids co congregate like schools and outdoor city pools. Um, we also really appreciate that the city is deciding not to opt in to billboard advertising that is allowed by the state. So those are protections that are really important from a public health standpoint. There's a few other um, things that we'd like to see um, city council consider. We'd like to see city council consider holding the dispensary hours of operations to 10. We all worked really hard three years ago to make sure that that happened. Um, we are concerned just from a, a safety standpoint about marijuana edibles being allowed because of the delayed impairment reaction that can happen with edibles. It's very soundly um, supported by science from the state health department. Um, again, I've heard some conversations about um, outlet density and the, and the licenses for dispensaries being lifted. Um, there are concerns about that, of course, because of proximity and, and density and the impacts on youth. Um, and so that's really our big things on, on, on hospitality. Um, on um, marijuana delivery, Smart Colorado went neutral on that bill in 2019. The reason being is because the proponents when it was brought in 2019 um, agreed from the get-go that there should be no delivery to the under 21 market. Um, and so that was why we went neutral on that bill. So our comments really about delivery, again, because it's it hasn't been done in Colorado, is that um, we worry a little bit about multiple deliveries going, multiple delivery services delivering to one particular location, creating the opportunity for um, a black market sales opportunity for youth. Um, and some of the other things we've listed here are really more for the public health and safety side and really more in the wheelhouse of, of, of um, the Denver Police Department and, and things like that. So that's really um, the extent of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if you'd like to keep up with what we're doing, um, Feel free to sign up for a free newsletter, um, free information on our website, just about the impacts on kids. And with that, I'll stop my screen share and um, say hello. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, the next presenter we have is um, Truman Bradley from the Marijuana Industry Group. Truman, are you there? And you should be able to share your screen. Hi, Loretta. Thank you. This Hi. is Truman from the Marijuana Industry Group. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Are you guys able to see the uh, yes. overview of licensed cannabis in Colorado? Okay, great. Yeah. I'm not going to go through all of these slides, but just to, as a brief background, um, the Marijuana Industry Group was founded in 2010 to represent the licensed business community for Colorado cannabis licensees. We've since expanded to 
uh, include ancillary companies, support companies, uh, staffing companies, payroll companies, those kinds of things. Uh, basically, anybody that touches the plant or supports, you know, uh, any businesses that, that are in that space are eligible to be made members. We've presented it at numerous RNO meetings over the years. This will be our 11th year. And um, just want to say thank you for the opportunity. Um, I used to own a couple of marijuana businesses in the city of Denver and was invited to join the board of We Can for a couple of years. And then after I um, exited those companies and moved on, I stepped out from We Can because I no longer own the business there. But um, just want to give a shout out. So hi. Um, Truman, can you make your can you make that full screen when we go to the other slides? Uh, yeah, I'll do my best here. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I can do that. Sorry. Um, sorry, how do I do that? Uh, go down to the bottom, uh, the the gray band at the bottom of your screen, and over on the right hand side. Keep going. Keep going. Right there. Whoops. Back. 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 Nope. Nope. Back. No, this. Right there. Yeah. Bingo. Okay, great. Um, so uh, very quickly, medical marijuana was legalized in Colorado in 2000. In 2013, Colorado became the first state to legalize adult use cannabis. Um, at the time, more people voted in Colorado to legalize adult use cannabis than had voted for any presidential candidate ever, all the way up through uh, and including Obama. I haven't actually run the data for um, the most recent two. So in my copious spare time, I will do that. I'm going to jump around a little bit. Um, there is medical and adult use cannabis. Over the years, these two um, programs have sort of come together um, in their, you know, in the types of laws that affect them. A couple of things I'll point out is that um, Colorado was the first to implement a regulatory uh, oversight of cannabis of any state in the in the in the union. And so licensees are taxed and regulated, highly regulated by different departments, including uh, the Marijuana Enforcement Division here in Denver, excise and license, as well as interfacing with the rest of uh, Denver's um, you know, regulators, whether that's uh, the building department, whether that's Denver Department of Health, etc. The Department of Ag oversees pesticide restrictions and OSHA comes in and checks out the cannabis licensees. When I owned my uh, dispensaries in Denver, I estimated that we were inspected about 20 times a year um, by various, by various um, inspectors. And, and that's a good thing. As you guys hopefully know, there's a seed to sale tracking program that the state requires all licensees to use. It's called metric. Um, and that's really tracks it all the way from the plant through the sale. Um, here are some, whoops, uh, just don't, here we go. Here are some of the things that all cannabis is tested for. This includes potency, microbials, any residual solvents that are used to make concentrates uh, with edibles and concentrates. There are tests for homogeneity to make sure that the products have the same amount of everything throughout the batch. If you could imagine like cookie dough or something like that. Um, everything is tested for pesticides as well as heavy metals. On the medical cannabis side, um, there can be youth that have medical cards that uh, go see a doctor every year, um, but otherwise you have to be 21 or over on the adult use side. Um, you cannot consume at the point of purchase in dispensaries, but obviously with the new social consumption rules that are being discussed in Denver, that would change. Uh, moving along here, um, we are really big advocates for regulation um, because of the things you see on the left side that I've been talking about. We can track this really well. Um, it's enforced by all the different agencies and the penalties for non-compliance are really severe. Uh, versus the non-licensed areas. And so uh, that's just something that I think Colorado's done a really good job of, you know, throughout this time, according to the Healthy Kids survey, we haven't seen um, an increase in youth use since, legis since legalization happened. A uh, quick look at what exists right now. Uh, the top line are stores, the middle line are grows, 
The next line are manufacturers of infused products uh, and then testing facilities. And I'm moving pretty quickly because some of this is old news. Um, MIG has partnered with different agencies to really try to keep both youth and adults safe. And this is something that continues to be uh, a high focus area for us. So uh, we're working with CDOT on their latest uh, impaired driving campaign. You know, we serve as the mouthpiece and the conduit to the licensees. And so if CDOT is pushing out a new initiative, we will work with the dispensaries and once it's legal, the social consumption venues to make sure that they are communicating, you know, the, the most important and latest and greatest messaging that's out there. Uh, we have not seen an increase in crime with legalization. Um, and so that's, I think, something that, you know, we're really proud of. The industry has currently a 97% compliance rate on state sting operations at the retail level, uh, which is 20 times, 29 times lower than uh, that of alcohol uh, here in Colorado, at least in 2019. Um, and here's that number for you right here. This comes from the Marijuana Enforcement Division. Uh, as I said, teen use has remained flat. I'm moving pretty quickly because I want to get to the Denver stuff. Um, tax revenue for the industry is one of the higher uh, areas for the state in terms of what they collect. Uh, so in 2020, the state collected $387 million. And then uh, local governments receive a portion of that in addition to the, the city sales taxes that Denver imposes. Uh, this is a quick slide about how the state spends its money. Um, it spends it on a number of different areas. I'll actually jump to the next one. Hopefully you guys can see this, but the state spends its money on public health and the environment, 20%, education, 16%, human services, 31%, and then it kind of goes on down from there. I jumped around a lot. Uh, when I think about the Denver ordinance, I really want to thank the city, Molly Duplachane, uh, Erica, who is also on here, uh, Ashley Kilroy and others for doing stakeholdering. What they're contemplating is pretty robust. And, you know, we're, we're, we're uh, looking forward to continuing to work with them on the, you know, on the draft. We do support the extension of hours. We've seen in other places such as Aurora and Edgewater that, you know, really the wheels haven't come off the bus with longer hours. Um, so, you know, we are supportive of that, but happy to answer any questions that you may have. And, and thank you for your time. <clears throat> All right, great, thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Okay, so I'm gonna go to questions and I know some people had their, their questions answered, but if you have a comment, keep it brief because we have a long list of people with questions. So the first person I wanna start with is Judy. I'm going by chronological order by what I saw in the chat. So Judy, um, you had a few questions. Do you wanna start? Questions have been answered. Okay, great. Thank you. That works great. Um, Lucia, did you have a question or comment or was it answered? Are you there, Lucia? She may be gone. All no, right. Sorry. No, they were answered in the chat. Thanks. Okay, great. Molly, you were doing a great job answering questions so far. Uh, Nancy, you had some questions. Yes, I do. Um, I would like um, Excel. Uh, uh, I would like that the communities get uh, get to see that template of the social impact plan because that's one thing that will that really impacts all of us in uh, INC the RNOs, and so it's really important to see what. Uh, the marijuana businesses will be held to. And my questions regard who is the response, who's responsible for monitoring those, what's in the social impact plan? Will it be self-monitoring by the marijuana businesses? What's the responsibility? What's going to be placed on RNOs to be monitoring that? Um, I have past experiences with the community engagement plans being from the Global Elyria Swansea neighborhoods. And um, it, it seems like they're just a piece of paper and the enforcement or checking on what these 
uh, you know, the great things that marijuana businesses are going to do in the communities don't really seem to come to fruition. And so I think that's really critical for us RNOs to have that template before it's voted on. And another thing is um, the tax dollars that go to communities. Uh, the one slide said that the tax dollars are there to help communities harmed by marijuana prohibition. I wonder what communities have been harmed by the prohibition of marijuana, uh, more so coming from Globville, Leary, Swansea, the communities have been harmed by having um, marijuana in our communities. And we certainly have suffered from the unintended consequences when Denver opened up um, you know, the marijuana businesses, especially cultivations in 2012. So I think that's really important to know, um, you know, what communities have been harmed by MJ prohibition. And I'm certainly interested in seeing something more specific about tax dollars going to communities. You know, we don't have any, what's the information on that? Instead of just ge a general, um, uh, a general, um, well, anyway, that's <laughs> more information. Please. Uh, a couple of things, Nancy, again, lots of questions. So I uh, will try to get to all of them. Um, on our marijuana info page on denvergov.org, there are several dashboards that provide detailed um, looks, deep dives into the revenue and spending. There's actually a map that you can look at and zoom in to see um, every single educational program in the city that the tax dollars have gone to. So um, I will make sure I send that to Loretta to, to share with you all how to find it. But it's, um, like I said, on our website, um, there's, there's um, we also do an annual report that talks about um, revenue and funding um, for programs throughout the city. So that, that's another good resource. Um, when it comes to the social impact plans, the ordinance, um, the updated draft includes a list of the things that are going to be required uh, on that. So um, I can't remember the exact page number off the top of my head, but it mm -hmm. that that language is in there. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be the bare minimum. Now we wouldn't create the template until the bill passed, but that would be for our implementation team to create forms. But that's something that um, we could certainly take community feedback on um, if, if and when we get to that step um, to kind of see if it would meet the needs of the RNOs who are gonna be looking at it and, and take some comments. I think that's something that um, we could easily incorporate. Um, and then there was something else. Oh, the, the reporting on the metrics, um, that would be a self-reporting requirement from the uh, businesses. Um, for example, if they said we wanted to hire three new employees from underrepresented groups um, on renewal, they would um, have to report, did they do that or did they not? Now, the city um, is not legally permitted to deny um, a renewal if they didn't meet their goal because you know that could be for any number of reasons, right? It could be because of COVID, they couldn't hire anybody new. Um, so that's not you know a reason that we could deny their license. But um, what it does do is it creates a more accessible more um, public facing opportunity, not just for RNOs, but for other community groups to weigh mm -hmm. in. Um, we've had one um, group talk about making report cards, so to speak, for businesses, um, you know, as a private organization, if they want to do that. Um, I know there's, you know, just like any legislator or group, you know, does um, create report cards for, um, you know, other types of things. This would be something that um, the community can, can use that information um, in whatever way they see fit. So um, that I think that answers all of the questions you had. I'm not sure. Well, I just just to comment then that I think that the social impact plan, maybe the intention is is great, but it could just end up being a document that's just rudimentary filled out. And do RNOs and individual groups really have time to be making report cards or doing the monitoring of that? So um, anyway, thank you for letting me put that out there. All right, great. Um, I think the next question I had was from Jeannie Granville. Are you uh, still there? 
Good. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's probably more of a process uh, question in terms of how GNAs fit in and how um, they are addressed within the context of the hearing. And so I think uh, that probably needs to be raised in another setting. Well, and, and the other thing I just want to respond is that when Molly sends the uh, sample GNA to me, we'll post that on the website because I think that would be helpful for our nose. And I will use this. Um, I've talked to Jean Granville about our uh, GNAs. Sorry, <laughs> uh, Malcolm. Um, I'm happy to come spend some time with any of your RNOs talking about GNAs, renewal hearings, petitions, other tools, the hearing policies and procedures, any of that. Um, we are um, focusing this year, I think, you know, as we've learned from COVID that um, digital resources are always very helpful. And so we're looking at um, some educational resources, handouts and videos um, that we can put on our website to help RNOs navigate the process. But um, you know, at any point, if you want to have me come talk, I don't mind doing it a hundred times until we get the videos posted. Um, that's always an option. Just reach out to us. All right, great. Next um, questions go to Christine. Oh, yeah. So I was just, I'm just kind of puzzled why this is all being put together. I understand the equity piece. Um, I understand what I think I understand what you're trying to do there um, but I'm really puzzled why you couldn't apply it to existing licenses licensure opportunities and why you had to combine it with these other newer opportunities thank you I want to make sure I understand your question so I, you're asking why we can't force existing licensees to have higher percent ownership um, by social equity applicants? Yes, do it in the existing retail market, for example, apply those principles to new, new entrants and make sure it happens there. Why did you have to tie it to the other licenses that you're proposing? Why is it all together? So it would apply to any um, new stores or cultivation. So um, we can't retroactively apply a requirement to a private business um, for an ownership structure on a license that they already have. Um, we are applying it to new opportunities for stores or centers as well as the delivery and hospitality. Um, there is, um, you know, one of the effects of the current cap is that um, the existing industry is pretty cemented. There is not a lot of um, change, I think, uh, Truman might be able to talk more about that, but um, there's less opportunity for folks to get into that market that has already been sort of established by the early adopters, um, stores and, and grows. Um, there, there is some opportunity, but not a lot of opportunity for new folks to get into the industry. And those are both um, quite expensive um, opportunities to begin with. So the transporter, delivery, hospitality options are um, different entry points for uh, to allow for a, a wider variety of startup um, opportunities for social equity applicants um, in, an, in, in an area of the industry where there is demand and where citizens have said that they want these types of, of amenities. Okay, so the difficulty with applying this to existing licensure opportunities is the driver behind the transporter licenses, the, the new licenses. I guess if I could just piggyback on what Erica was saying, um, you know, one of the challenges, I think the biggest challenge to increasing um, social equity participation in the cannabis industry is access to capital, right? These licenses are very expensive to get. These operations are expensive to build out. If you want to start a grow facility, you know, that's not a, that's not a small undertaking. And so, um, in the stakeholder process, we pushed the city of Denver really, really hard to try to find some funding to help, you know, literally put their money where their mouth is, but keeping it real, it's COVID. There is no money. Employees are getting furloughed everywhere. And so Governor Polis has asked the um, Joint Budget Committee to 
carve out five million dollars for low interest or no interest loans you know workforce development programs etc for social equity applicants and that really will be the thing that makes the difference but to erica's point um you know to just say okay hey social equity folks go ahead and buy a license buy a dispensary out i mean that's not that's not cheap at this stage in the game so i think you know, I don't want to put words in this city's mouth, but I'm guessing that's why they have made some of the decisions they've made. I, I hear you. I just don't understand. It sounds like that, therefore, that drove the rest of this proposal. That's okay, for thank, thanks for the comment. I think we'll move on to the next person. And, and you know, I, I know you're still taking comments again. If you want to put that link into the chat, that might be helpful. Um, so Troopdi, next person, Troopdi, do you still have a question? Troopdi, are you still on? No, no, you, sorry, sorry. No, we're good, thank you. Okay, great. All right, next person is Carol. Did you still have a question? Or was it answered, Carol? Okay, we'll come back to you then. Um, uh, Adrian, do you still have a question? Oh, I'm done. Thank you for the great answers. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Jane Lormer, you had a question? I, I am presenting a motion, which I put in the chat at 1052. Um, the motion is this uh, set of marijuana regulations be debundled and voted upon separately by council and that the three ordinances be presented over the course of three council meetings to permit adequate time for thorough analysis, feedback and discussion. All right, we have a motion on the floor. I don't, I haven't had a, I haven't seen a second in the chat, so. And, and, and I kind of want to get to the other questions too, because I want to make sure that people get things answered. Um, so, I mean, if you second it, I want to hear that from, I want to hear from you. So unmute and say you second it. I see Miles that seconded. I no, second. Chat. Okay. I second. There you go. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold this and we can keep having a discussion, but I wanna get questions answered so that people have a full understanding so that we can get back to that motion. So, so why don't we go ahead, um, um, next person. Um, Thank you, Loretta. Okay, thanks. Um, next person is Ellen, do you have a question? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I first wanna thank, you know, all, all the presenters um, especially you, Erica and Molly, for, for taking the time to really lay out um, the legislation. It's a huge PowerPoint. I know it's, it's a lot to get through, and I've tried to get through it a few times my, on my own, but it's been a, um, it's just a lot of information. So it's really nice to hear, um, to hear from you. Um, I guess my question is also about the bundling of things. And, you know, I, I, you know, as a, like uh, I'm open about it as a, a marijuana consumer myself on occasion, I you know don't have a problem necessarily seeing it delivered or anything like that. Um, but I wonder about in terms of like from from an equity lens, how the hospitality exemption is protecting workers in um, restaurants or bars. Um, you know, it seems like the the things put in place. Um, protect other patrons, but maybe not necessarily employees of those establishments. Um, so I just wonder if there's um, any consideration made there. Because I know they were a big part of the original Clean Indoor Air Act. Yes. Um, so the state uh, laws and rules are, are going to govern on that um, because they're um, state concern, but I know that a couple of provisions that I'm remembering from the state provisions are that for mobile establishments, um, the driver has to be completely separated from the patrons in the area where the consumption is happening. Um, there's also concern for um, if there's a provision that states if a um, city official um, or inspecting official or you know anyone wants to come in that the consumption has to stop um, either on a mobile or brick and mortar, um, the ventilation plans are going to have to address 
um, how the employees are protected from those establishments. Um, but there is also, you know, the point that um, employees of certain types of businesses, like um, a cigar bar, for example, um, or a hookah lounge, um, and you know, now with this bill would be, you know, um, a, a smoking or vaping establishment. Um, that is part of what they, you know, sign up for when they take that job, and they would have those same protections as employees in those other um, types of businesses, whether it's marijuana or not. Now, um, there, I'm not the scientific um, expert on the difference between the effects of smoke um, from tobacco products versus marijuana products. So, um, if you're interested, email us, and we'll, we'll we can link you up with somebody um, with more information on that. Um, we can also um, try to look at the, um, now I've lost my train of thought. Oh, for the restaurants, there is um, separate requirements. Um, so I believe the, because the food prep portion of the restaurant in Truman might know this better than me actually, but there are provisions that prevent um, the food prep handlers from being, um, from accessing the areas that are for consumption only. So it would be similar to a cigar lounge type portion of a restaurant, um, not like the um, smoking sections of old um, that some of us might remember before they were gone. Yeah, Erica, I think that's right. Um, that, you know, exactly right. Basically all the, all the parts of the Clean Air Act that apply would apply here. So it's really the same. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, next person who had a question or comment was Travis. Did you want to question or comment? Oh, I don't think I had my hand raised. Oh, I, I just know you put something in the chat. So. Oh, oh, oh I was just said. Oh, thank you so much. Well, thanks for calling on me. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to the city folks and to the other presenters for their comprehensive, concise presentations. And I think it's always helpful for them uh, to conduct the appropriate due diligence and outreach to organizations like ours. And we look forward to sharing this um, information with it, <clears throat> excuse me, within our own boundaries. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Cindy, did you have a question or comment? Are you Cindy, you're yes. <laughs> okay, um, I do have a, a question. As far as the number of licenses that are going to be given out um, to the social equity new partners, how many is the cap and um, in each category, I guess, is my question. Hi, Cindy. Uh, so there wouldn't be a cap anymore. Um, it would just be um, limited to social equity applicants for all of those categories. The only categories that wouldn't be subject to um, that exclusivity um, that currently also aren't subject to caps are um, testing facilities and research and development, medical research and development. So um, the the restrictions would come for the neighborhoods of undue concentration, and those would be based on wherever the highest numbers are, um, whatever those high numbers are, um, those would not be allowed to have any new or transferred locations. So when you have done the plotting of all of that, um, do you have any idea how many more could be added with the distance and dens density proximity? It's hard to come up with a number because that would require, you know, counting storefronts and considering things like whether the landlord would um, rent to a, a marijuana business. Um, if there's one new, you know, if there's an area that's, you know, an acre or so, um, there might be an option for two stores to go if they're at both ends, but if one goes in the middle, um, it would then create a proximity restriction that would, you know, effectively eliminate that bubble. So it's really hard to get an idea of numbers, but I think um, what we might be able to do is come up with an approximate acreage of city land available. Molly, do you have an idea? Um, maybe uh, not to do that. I just add, 
Yeah. So we're working on um, getting some maps made for both stores and hospitality businesses that will show a general idea of how much space is available given the proximity restrictions, the neighborhoods of undue concentration, zoning restrictions, um, which really are the biggest piece to the puzzle. Um, and so those will probably be posted on our website sometime next week and we can send the link out when they're ready. But I think that'll give you the best idea of how much space is, is still available. So like Erica said, there's a lot of analysis that would still have to go into looking at like each site to determine its eligibility or likelihood that something would go there. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Thank you. Uh, next person I had was Robert. Do you have a comment or a question? Can you un can you unmute? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know why I can't. Anyway, um, I taught 20 years overseas in Asia and 20 years in Germany. And I love to take my students traveling. I took a hundred trips with my students all over South Korea and traveled with them in Japan and Okinawa. And I also taught in Germany and ironically, my students there were different than in Asia. They wanted to go to the Netherlands. They wanted to go to the Netherlands to smoke marijuana. I was, I was stunned. That was their goal and being in Europe. So I, I'm an old man now. I don't understand why people think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I know it makes a lot of money for the state. Now we're totally dependent upon some of this marijuana money. They're prospering during this recession. They're prospering during this pandemic. They're making money hand over fist and we're spending two hours promoting, it seems like promoting this idea. I know there's the opposition, but we've got a man from the marijuana industry telling us how great it is for us economically, politically, socially. I think it's not a, a, an opportunity to make our society better. I seriously doubt it. Thank you for letting me speak. All right, thanks for your comment. Um, next person, Susan Payne, do you have something? Susan, can you unmute or do you still have a question or comment? All right, I'm gonna go on. Zoe, do you wanna comment or do you have a question? Um, no, my question was answered by both parties. So you okay, can do it in the chat. Okay, on. thanks. Um, Alani, did you have a question or comment? No, I'm fine, thanks. Okay, question answered. Okay, great. Next person, um, Brian Wilson, did you have a question or comment? My question was answered. Um, comment um, now, um, being from, from allies to abolitionists, um, one comment that I hear a lot is that this is just an industry that seems to be have, there's a stranglehold on it by white business owners. So this is kind of a follow up to I guess Robert's comment. Um, just to open up that accessibility to people other than white business owners, that's, that's what I see this as. It's not, we're not promoting um, we, not we, they <clears throat> are not promoting marijuana. It's accessible access to it is how, is how I look at it. Thanks, that's all. Okay, thank you. Um, last person, then we're gonna go to the, um, the motion that's on the floor and have a discussion. Um, last person I think was Bruce and that's the last one for today. Any co question, comment? Or you might've gotten it answered, I think. Not hearing anything. All right, um, we have a motion on the full floor and I'm gonna share my screen. I'm hoping that, I think I have it. Ah, there we go. Can you all see it? This is the, the motion that uh, was brought by Jane, Jane Lormer and was seconded by Miles. Um, the set of marijuana regulations be debundled and voted upon separate by council and that the three ordinance be presented over the course of three 
city council meetings to permit adequate time for thorough, I think that means, um, thorough analysis, I think it should say, um, feedback and discussion. Um, is there any any discussion, any questions? Yeah, hi, this um, is Tripti. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I don't see that being able to raise hands, otherwise I'd be raising hands for whatever reason. But I, I guess my question is, is the motion being presented right now so that Inc, basically Inc delegates are saying we would want or not want this. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I look at myself as an Inc delegate for Sunnyside and without actually talking to anybody else in my neighborhood about this, I would just be abstaining and I would think everyone should be otherwise are we speaking for ourselves only if we're not, you know, asking our community who we say we represent first? So, you know, I guess that that's my question. I'm not sure, you know, so I'll let other folks talk. Thank you. Okay, and thanks for that. Um, um, Zoe, I see your hand up. It's really hard for me too to see this because when I'm sharing, I can't do much else. <laughs> go ahead, Zoe, go ahead. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to like add to that, that. Um that all of this information has been available publicly for a while. You can watch the meetings that uh, Erica and Molly had. Um, and they're, they're very informative. There was a lot of public comment on those meetings and I feel like it was um, really well put together. And if you wanna inform yourself that information is available, it, was, it has been available. We've talked about it at other Inc meetings, so I, don't see any reason for bewandling it and discussing it further. That's just going to slow it down. Well, and 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 I'm just going to ask. I, you know, I mean, the question that I have is, I mean, and we want delegates to take things to their RNOs, um, and I know there's been the offer for America to bring this to, you know, other RNOs if you want to present. Uh, the other thing is, is that do we want to? table this until people can take this to their RNOs because um, we didn't have this sent out. We didn't have this motion sent out to people. So um, so let, let me know. I, I know there's not a lot of time. So that's the question. When is it voted on by city council again? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so we are currently scheduled to present at committee on March 2nd. Um, now committee could you know, go a, a couple of different ways. Um, they could say um, they, they could vote yes to promote it to the full council, um, which would mean it would go to city council for a couple of different readings um, a, a, a few weeks after that. Um, but they may tell us, um, hey, we need more time to think about this, come back. They've done that in other situations for other bills. Um, but at that point, it would just be um, that it would be feedback to city council rather than to us um, because we are proposing the bills for consideration by city council. So ultimately they're the ones that would vote on it. Um, and as I mentioned, March 2nd is when we're currently scheduled to present to them, but you know, if they have something else come up, they can always tell us, hey, we need to push you back. Um, th they won't have us come any sooner, but they, they may push us, they may delay us. That happens sometimes. The other question is, would there be public, I thought there was public comment at the March 2nd. So I see Molly shaking her head yes, and Erica shaking her head yes. So there is public comment time, you know, at that meeting. So that, that just so everybody is aware of that. <clears throat> um, and then Brian asked to clarify, is the presentation to committee or to full council? Is it just a committee? Or the, the presentation is to finance and government committee. Um, so we will send out a bulletin. Um, so if at the end of that presentation, there's a link to sign up for our bulletin. Um, we always publish um, things like that there. Um, I will also forward that to the RNO distribution list, which I um, have sent the last couple of bulletins to, um, but there is public comment there. Um, at that March 2nd meeting. So we'll, we'll put information about how to sign up for that in the bulletin. So, and I think the question is, um, since it's just going to committee, not to the full council, correct? 
for the presentation. Now, if and when the committee um, votes, they they vote on whether the bill advances to the full committee. So, um, okay. if the committee is um, you know convinced or votes for the presentation and the proposals to move forward, then they would still be considered by the full council. And it would be approximately two weeks after that for the first reading and then the following week for the vote. Okay. So my question for the movement of the, of the motion, Jane, um, if you would um, allow this to go back to, um, it would be presented at our next INC meeting. I know that's going to be a tight meeting, but if we could present it at the next meeting after delegates could take it back to their RNOs, um, we would have time then because if it's March 2nd and then two weeks after would be, sorry, I can't even think right now, but <laughs> two weeks after that, which would be the 16th, and our delegate meeting will be on the 13th. Um, Jane, are you okay with that? So people can at least take take this information back to everybody, you know, especially like the slideshow. Yes, as long as the slides uh, from both, or actually the three groups are sent to the delegates. And I've just received the ones from um, Henny so that those will be posted also on the website. So everybody you know, all of those from RNOs, you'll be able to get those and pull those down and refer people to those on our website, okay? And and um, and I don't know if I have... Um, Christine has something. Christine? Can I clarify something or ask a, question, a clarifying question? Sure. Um, because I don't have the presentation in front of me and I sort of can't go back, but... Um, I just want to make sure that we have the wording right before we do this. Am I right, Erica, that what we're really asking is that ENL excise and licenses would modify the first part, the omnibus bill, to in some in some way because the second part, which is for the um, social uh, uses and the transporter licenses, would be pulled out for the future. So wouldn't there have, wouldn't we also be asking for modifications? And then are, is everything else in the second bill and the third bill is just repeal? I just want to clarify that we have language that makes sense to bring back, to send out to delegates. Sure. And the drafts, uh, the bill drafts are on our website um, that I popped in the chat so you can access them there. But the first bill is the, is the omnibus bill and it, covers the, um, the uh, equity provisions, the code modifications, and then the adding of the delivery program. The second and third bill are um, both on hospitality, the second bill um, opting into the state hospitality program and the third repealing the citizen initiative. Um, I think the only reason those are separate is because there are particular rules that apply to citizen initiatives. Um, otherwise, it, it likely would have all just been in one single proposal. That's what I was, that's what I'm asking. So I think we're going to have to modify the language. But. Are you saying modify the language of the motion? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, we need that now. We need that now and need to do that now. Do you need to look at it? I mean, and, and that's and that's up to Jane whether you're modifying it and, and to Miles who seconded it. So I can't do that on the run. Okay. I I, I mean we have to get that out to RNOs now and, and I don't and so I don't know if we have anything for that. Um I am I we are over time. We're almost to noon. We were to adjourn today at at 1130, but clearly we had a lot of questions and a lot of good discussion. And I really want to thank our presenters today because I think it was well worthwhile. I think it, it, it informs our RNOs and our delegates so that we can get it back that information back to our RNOs. And, and I want to 
Um, thank all of you for presenting. And I want to thank all the thoughtful questions that we had and comments. So um, if there's nothing else, I, I am going to send out that motion to um, we'll send that out to everyone, to all the delegates, um, and that you can send that out to um, to all your, you know, if you have an RNO meeting, hopefully you'll be able to get that out there or get it in a newsletter. Is there anything else before we adjourn today? Again, I want to thank everybody. And it was a good group of, I think we had 58 people and now we still have 48. And thank you all for attending today. And please um, consider being a member on our board and bringing great conversations like this. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks everyone for having us. Thanks guys. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you.